morning. I'm going to call, uh, call us uh, to attention and get us started. Um, so I'm going to step aside now uh, and invite uh, Kateri up uh, for the land acknowledgement. Sego sego goego, anibuju, dansagahio, and good morning, Kat uh, everyone. My name is Kateri, and I'm a member of the Little Red River Cree Nation. I am also a student at U of T studying architecture and indigenous studies. I am happy to be here and honored to deliver the land acknowledgement for governing cities in the 21st century. Uh, the city of Ditskarundo is situated upon the land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, and Wendat peoples who have cared for this land since time immemorial. Today, Ditskarundo is home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island and continues to be governed by the Dish with One Spoon Territory Agreement. Delivering a land acknowledgement is a way to respectfully honor and the traditional caretakers of the land while recognizing the enduring relationship between indigenous peoples and their home territories. It is also a reflection process in which to build mindfulness and intention upon walking into a gathering such as we are having today. The acknowledgement should be rooted in the land that we are honored to stand on and should guide how we move forward in both conversations and actions. And I ask you to keep this in mind today. Nia Wangoa, Chi Miigwech, Ginnaskmolten, and thank you. Thank you, Kateri. It's wonderful to have you with us today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great uh, to have you here today uh, for the Governing Cities in the 21st Century Conference, uh, sponsored by and hosted by the School of Cities. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that we're hosting this event uh, during Ramadan. Uh, so for anyone observing Ramadan today, uh, Ramadan Mubarak. Um, the School of Cities was launched uh, a year ago to convene uh, people and ideas. And our goal is to be a hub uh, for the 400 uh, academics and thousands of students at the, at the University of Toronto uh, across dozens of disciplines uh, that focus on cities. Uh, and it's a place to bring those people together around ideas of research, uh, education, and outreach and engagement. And our goal and our mandate is to implement programming that is impactful and makes a difference uh, in the cities in which we live. Our goal is really to be out in the community and in the communities, working with others together as a partnering organization to bring people together and allow us uh, to deliver cities that are, that are better and more thoughtful and more just and fair and sustainable than we could deliver working in our own organizations on our own. The School of Cities is at the cutting edge of a transformation in the way that universities engage with uh, communities. Uh, according to a new report that came out from the British Council just recently, just in May, um, it says that universities are needed more than ever to help tackle the serious challenges faced by cities and towns. Universities play a special role within communities. Uh, we can convene people, we, can, uh, we educate students, thousands of students per year, and we engage with uh, communities and our research uh, can help inform uh, action but only if we're out engaging and working together and in partnership. And the School of Cities, as I've mentioned, is at, a, at, is at the leadership, at the leading edge of universities globally that are aiming to work much more closely with their communities and tie together communities globally to better understand the challenges that cities face around inequality, around sustainability, around funding and financing, around injustice, and to come up with strategies that work and that can be implemented and give uh, hope that we have alternatives to, this, to the future that uh, we're heading for today. So the most city, I'm pleased to, that the School of Cities is taking leadership uh, in many of these endeavors. And let me just highlight a few areas where uh, we're working. The School of Cities is organized around three key themes, research, education, and outreach and engagement. And in each of those areas, We've taken a leadership role in building new partnerships just in the past year since we've been founded, building new partnerships and new collaborations to show what the university can do as it builds these types of relationships uh, that are quite new at the moment, but are meant for the long term and are meant to help uh, engage with uh, communities right across this city and globally uh, in order to drive uh, positive change together. So 
With regards to research, um, we've launched a, a Grand Challenges program, uh, and the goal of the Grand Challenges program is to focus on the most pressing issues uh, that cities face, but importantly, it's not just a research program. For all of the participants in, uh, and all of the, the projects that are, are, are in that program, we encouraged them and required them, in fact, to have partners from four different disciplines, three different faculties, two different University of Toronto campuses, because we have campuses in Mississauga, Scarborough, and downtown, plus a community partner and a city partner. And I'm pleased to say we have eight projects going at the moment on a wide range of topics ranging from transportation and mobility to governance uh, to um, uh, climate change and resilience to food and livability uh, and also uh, affordable housing. All of these being done in collaboration across disciplines and with communities. We've also started something called the Urban Pilot Lab, uh, which is uh, intended to work with uh, communities and governments and firms and nonprofit organizations if they're implementing programs and policies, we want to be your partner to evaluate how those programs are working and to provide insight on how they can be done better. Uh, and our first uh, initiative uh, is a capstone course for students uh, to engage uh, transdisciplinary uh, students from across a variety of disciplines to work with governments and with uh, community organizations and firms on these type of projects. So again, the educational mandate of uh, the university is baked right into our research uh, initiatives. With regards to education, this is again critical to, to, to educating the next generation of students and civic leaders, is to have them working in communities in a meaningful way and designing their own projects that take a leadership role. Through our uh, courses uh, and traditional education programs, we provide all sorts of uh, disciplinary education to students. And our, uh, the School of Cities is providing other opportunities for students to engage and really design their own uh, projects. And we've done this in a number of different ways. We have a fellowship program uh, that's brought on board 21 uh, students who've come up with their own projects that are, are deeply engaged with the communities around them. We have students working on uh, projects with indigenous uh, groups uh, and on, on reconciliation. We have projects looking at the environment. We have projects looking at digital justice. These are projects led by students who are coming up with their own ideas and we're providing uh, the support uh, both financially and intellectually to build a community. Uh, where these ideas can, can, can be fostered. Uh, we've also designed an, a student academy which is an even bigger group to allow students to, to, again, design their own projects and work together across disciplines to come up with ideas and, and innovations that we as a faculty and we as community couldn't have come up with on our own and to work with the students to foster their ideas and allow them to implement uh, their dreams. Then on outreach and engagement, um, we've, we've been very active in our first year. Uh, we've hosted over 50 events uh, with partners right across uh, the university and right across the city. And again, University of Toronto is a very big institution and our role is to bring people together internally to start thinking uh, in a really interdisciplinary way and to create uh, the mechanisms and the bridges that connect people. And uh, we've, we've hosted events right across the university and then out into, into communities as well. And just to give you a few examples, uh, we've hosted, we hosted an event on the future of employment lands uh, with, uh, that the city of Toronto was uh, a major, uh, played a major role in, the planning department. Uh, we hosted an urban career expo uh, uh, through the education pillar uh, that brought students together to learn about the wide range of, uh, of, of employment opportunities. That are, available, uh, that are available in uh, the city building uh, professions and we brought them together with leading uh, professionals uh, to, to, to learn those types of ideas. Um, and we've hosted a whole host of other events uh, on uh, race uh, and equality, on indigenous uh, reconciliation uh, and all sorts of other issues that are critical to the functioning of our cities. And so today, um, and, and so going forward, we have a number of different initiatives that, that pick up on these themes of working together and building internal collaborations and external uh, uh, collaborations as well. And I'll just name uh, a few to give you a sense of what is, what is coming uh, in the months uh, ahead. Um, we have a collaboration for a speaker series uh, uh, with the Toronto Public Library called On uh, Public Life Speaker Series, uh, which is gonna start in uh, September, so stay tuned for that. We've developed an incubator for collaborative and creative mixed-use buildings, 
We think there's a huge opportunity in this city for co-location of different types of public and private uses so that we can benefit from, so that the city and the, and the citizens benefit from all of the development that's been taking place. Uh, and this is a, a project that, uh, that has philanthropic support uh, in order uh, to enable us to create this incubator uh, facility, kind of like a matchmaking service for mixed use buildings. We have the Student Fellows and Academy program, uh, which is gonna continue uh, taking place and you'll see uh, many of the projects uh, in the months ahead. Um, we're developing uh, and about to launch a community uh, fellowship program with, uh, in partnership with the United Way to give uh, community-based uh, uh, practitioners an opportunity uh, to, to work with the university uh, and, and for us to share knowledge and learn from each other. And so that's a program that we'll be launching soon. So if you're in a community organization, uh, keep an eye out for that. That will be coming, uh, that will be coming soon. Uh, we have a community-engaged research partnership with the Wellesley Institute to understand uh, inequality uh, especially in the inner suburbs. And finally, at a, at a, at a global scale, uh, at a global scale, we've launched uh, a collaboration uh, with um, the Tata Trust uh, to look at uh, smart cities and innovation uh, in uh, India. And finally, we're also at a national scale where the academic partner with uh, an initiative called the Urban uh, Project that's looking at how cities uh, can develop innovative solutions uh, at a national scale and bring stakeholders together to drive better solutions. So fundamental to what we do is this idea of collaboration, interdisciplinarity, and togetherness. And these are themes that you're gonna hear coming out in uh, today's uh, conference as well as we focus on the topic of urban governance. Because it's now clear that, uh, that, that governance extends well beyond the walls of City Hall. No organization today is governing the city on its own. They are working in deep collaboration uh, across disciplines and across organizations in order to impact the type of cities uh, that we're experiencing. And yet our cities, and, and out of this, what we could call a networked style of urban governance, out of this, uh, out, out, out of this new form of, of, of approaching the governance of cities, we've shifted from government to governance of cities. There are these real challenges that are being faced and that our city is facing and cities globally are facing as well. The first is an issue of scale. How do we govern cities that are increasingly large and increasingly complex? where the challenges reach across the, the governmental boundaries that we've drawn on the map. Whether we talk about transportation or water or income inequality, they don't stop at the municipal boundaries. And they, they don't care about jurisdiction between the provinces, the cities, and the federal governments. And yet, we are grappling with how we bring these different organizations together in order to solve these complex problems. And the most complex problem, the wickedest problem, climate change, really doesn't care about who's in charge. Emissions don't care about which level of government is responsible for them. And so we are grappling with how we govern cities at scale. And, and in Canada, we have one set of scale, and then you go abroad and you see cities uh, in parts of Asia or in Africa or in Latin America that are now at the 20 million mark in terms of their populations and pushing 20 million. And you think, how do we govern these increasingly large complex organisms? So a first point is a, is a question of scale. Second, we can talk about disruptive innovation that we've seen in the last decade or decade and a half, a whole host of disruptive innovations that have come to cities and cities are trying to figure out how to respond. The most obvious ones are uh, the tech innovations, the platform economies like Uber or Lyft or the scooters that if you're in American cities, you can sometimes see them littered all across the sidewalks, Lime and Bird. Um, but there's also other innovations that we've had to grapple with as well that are much more mundane, but you could still consider innovations. Like food carts. How do we handle the old hot dog cart when food trucks are coming to our city? We grappled with that and had big debates in this city about something as mundane as how to handle food carts and food trucks, right? So how, what happens when disruptive innovation comes? Because there's a difference between being a disruptor on the internet. If you're um, Facebook and you displace MySpace, no one except for the investors in MySpace are crying over the loss of MySpace. But we are concerned about what happens when disruption comes to uh, the front doors of our cities and where someone in an Airbnb is having a party at all hours next to our house or puts their garbage bins right in front of our front door. 
that brings a different meaning to the word disruption. And so cities are having to respond at pace in a world where the, the firms that are bringing these innovations have not come to try to follow the rules. They have a model of move quickly, break things, and ask for forgiveness after. So how do cities respond? And how, what, how do our regulatory systems work in those type of environments? So we can think of disruptive innovation as a second area where our, where our governance models, not government alone, but governance models are increasingly uh, stretched uh, to their limits. Third is this idea of balancing local uh, and uh, regional needs. And we've seen this debate playing out in this region. What is the right level of governance and government to handle things like transportation and mobility and land use planning? These are the types of questions that we debate because as things get scaled up, we know that the challenges we face uh, uh, go across municipal boundaries. But people also want to be uh, locally engaged. And so how do you ensure that the types of decisions that are being made are uh, both uh, local, uh, locally rooted and locally accountable and also uh, take the uh, region's best interests at heart. And that's the final point I wanna uh, just highlight is this idea of democratic accountability. We are really grappling with how uh, local democracy works in a context where the challenges are much bigger and where we have a constitution that is now about 150 years old and was not written with cities in mind. And we're seeing this playing out at the federal level, at the municipal level, and in particular recently at the provincial level. And people are responding, saying, how, am, how are these levels of government accountable? How does this system fit together to enable us to deliver uh, the 21st century cities uh, that we desire? So this is the challenge of governing the city in the 21st century that, I, that we are going to talk about uh, today uh, at, at the conference. A few quick housekeeping notes. Um, at the back of the room, uh, we, have, we have a quiet space, uh, and the quiet room uh, is available to anyone throughout the day who would wish uh, to take a break from the event, and uh, we just ask that all individuals using the room respect the nature of the space uh, and, and others that are using it. And the only other point is the washrooms, which are just at the back of the room, down the hall, uh, on the left. So, uh, and finally, uh, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is available and there are signs with the passwords uh, scattered around the room so you can get access to Wi-Fi uh, while you're at the event. So those are the housekeeping notes. That's a bit of an overview of, uh, of, of the key theme uh, for uh, today's event. And now it gives me great pleasure uh, to uh, introduce our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Micheline Lafleche. Uh, Micheline is uh, Vice President of Strategy and Policy at the United Way of Greater Toronto. Uh, prior to joining the United Way in 2011, she worked as a consultant with Civic Action, uh, and from 2001 to 2009 uh, was Chief Executive of the Runnymede Trust, a leading social policy and research charity in the United Kingdom. Uh, Micheline holds a master's degree from the University of Toronto and a bachelor's degree from the University of Ottawa. Uh, at the United Way, uh, she has built uh, a team uh, to deliver on six major research studies and reports on inequality and precarious work over the last eight years, along with other reports. Her team's work frames and informs United Way's strategic direction and uh, community investment strategy. And these are the themes, these are some of the themes that are going to come out in uh, Micheline's uh, talk today. So with that, uh, I welcome uh, Micheline Lafleche. The pens have multiplied here. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thanks, Matty. Uh, thanks, everyone. We're really pleased uh, to be here today uh, to be able to talk about some of the work that we've been doing, in particular, uh, a report that we published just a couple of weeks ago on income inequality. And so I just wanted to say before I start that I'm not an urban planner. I've never worked in geography or thinking about things from that perspective or planning or transportation. Um, I'm a sociologist by training. And uh, I come at this from the perspective of uh, governing cities in the 21st century is really about what's happening to the residents in the city region that we live in and that we love. And we come at it at United Way from this perspective because we, we have the, the view that to be a great city, 
you have to be a great city that's great for everybody. So that's the foundation of what we think about and what I'm going to say. And indeed, Toronto is a great city because we score high on lots of things. Uh, we get lots of accolades, like all these and more, uh, that are listed on the Toronto City website. Uh, so ranked in the top 20 of the Mercer Quality of Living Survey repeatedly over the last years, number seven of 140 in the 2018 Economist, Livable survey, uh, Economist Livability Survey, number eight of 165 in the Cities in Motion Index, number five of 110 for the best location for millennials, uh, and then, of course, in some industry rankings as well around tech talent and around global financial centers. And most of these include things like cohesion, uh, how the city feels for people, what, what we get at it as residents here in the region, quality of life overall, um, which is really important. Uh, and that's important because we, of course, tell ourselves the story that we are uh, diverse and that we're comfortable with diversity here in Toronto and Toronto region. And in fact, our motto for the city is diversity is our strength. Um, and we think that we have a city where we have a collective identity here and that it's founded on the trust and commitment we share for each other despite the diversity that we have. Um, Next slide, please. <laughs> right. So I wanted us not to forget one little uh, accolade that we have as well. It's the raccoon capital of Canada. And I'll challenge anyone in the room who has not found a raccoon eating their cat food in the kitchen. Um, I certainly have on far too many occasions. But all those nice accolades uh, are great. But when we score low on these ones, uh, that's a challenge for our city. And in fact, the research that we've done, uh, we, we declared Toronto to be the income inequality capital of Canada in 2015. And, and sad to report that the more recent report that we're going to talk about a bit today uh, confirms that finding. But others have found it to be the uh, housing unaffordability and the child poverty capital of Canada as well. And these are things that are major challenges for us as a city and a region. Uh, things that cross boundaries and borders, as Matty has said, uh, and things that we have to work on together in order to make the change that we need so that the city is a great city that is, in fact, great for everyone. So our vision at United Way is, is this, that local communities, that we have local communities where everyone, regardless of the background or the circumstances that they find themselves in, can thrive. Many of you know that we're investors in community. We support a network of community agencies across the city region that enable people to um, get ahead, uh, find the help that they need, when they need it, where they need it, uh, and to, to make life better for themselves and together. But we also look particularly at uh, systemic issues, the things that underline the challenges that people are facing. And that's where the research role comes in for United Way. Um, we're not necessarily as well known for that, although I, I hope this crowd does know us for that. Um, and that research uh, you'll find, uh, if you don't know us, is really about trying to understand the, not just the symptoms of the challenge, but what's, what's causing them and how might we address them. And these are just a few of the reports that we've done over the years. Uh, there are many more. But I think the thing that I would just want to point out is that there's a common thread uh, between all of them. And that is that we focus on poverty and inequality what it looks like, how it's changed, its dynamics, and how other features of our city region make it better or worse for the people who are experiencing it. And by the way, when we think about the people experiencing it, we think everybody experiences it because it doesn't matter whether you're in the have or the have not group. What's happening to, to us as people happens to all of us in some way or other. The work I'm going to talk about first is our income inequality work. And uh, some of you will know the blue one on the end is the third in a series uh, that we published just a couple of weeks ago. What we've done with this series is really try to explore income inequality in our city region from a lot of different angles. Uh, at first, in the red one, we were looking at uh, households, uh, individuals, and neighborhoods together. Uh, in the red and yellow one, we were comparing what was happening in the Toronto CMA to other large Canadian uh, municipalities uh, and, and CMA areas, Calgary, Vancouver, Montreal. And then we looked at things across Ontario, across Canada, and then more recently in the gold and the blue one uh, by region, by Peel, York, and Toronto, and Durham and Halton as well. 
Uh, I'd just like to point out we are Peel York in Toronto at United Way Greater Toronto, uh, not Durham and Halton as well. Um, and I'd like to say we also, we used a lot of public data sets, StatsCan data sets, and we've used um, StatCan's data sets that are not public that you have to gain access to, but we've also done our own survey research for some of this work. And here's a little map that uh, you'll be familiar with. It's our map, but it looks an awful lot like David Hilchansky's maps as well, and that's because we work with David on a lot of things, uh, and indeed uh, his team produced this map for us uh, for our gold report on this opportunity in the greater Toronto area. And what this shows, and what all the research that we've done over these eight years and that others have done, is that income inequality, no matter how you look at it, no matter what data set you use, no matter what measure you use, household or individual income, before tax or after tax, it's growing. It has grown, it has stalled a little bit, uh, but it is still actually growing. And in the GTA, it is growing more than it is in the rest of Canada. There is no other finding. We have lots of debate about that still, but there is actually no other finding. And what this map tells us is that now, compared to 35 years ago, and I'm sorry, I don't have the 35-year-old map up there, uh, but trust me, uh, I'm a sociologist, um, <laughs> you're much more likely to be either in a, a have or a have-not neighborhood. Middle-income neighborhoods are disappearing, and the gap between the have and the have-not is growing. But our new report, the blue one, isn't about neighborhoods now. We're going to take it to a different, we've taken it to a different uh, level and a different set of measures. We're looking at how different groups of people are impacted by growing income inequality, trying to understand which groups of people in our city region are actually bearing the burden of growing income inequality, and then trying to identify ways to mitigate that and then to get underneath it and bring it to an end. And we're interested in this because of the impact that income inequality has on access to opportunity and people's ability to get ahead. It also has a major impact on our sense of social cohesion, the glue that binds us together, the set of shared values that we have that make us feel committed to each other and want to support each other in the public realm, in policy making, in the way that we talk about each other and interact with each other. And it's a simple intuitive uh, equation uh, Effort plus what we call access to opportunity should lead to success. But we know from research, ours and others, that in societies that are more unequal, access to um, circumstances that are beyond your control, the things like the color of your skin, where you, whether you were born in Canada or not, or even what neighborhood you grew up in in a city region like Toronto, have a greater influence on whether or not you're going to get access to the opportunities you need to get ahead and ultimately to the outcomes that you will experience as an adult. And this is particularly true for those at the high and the very high uh, income end of the spectrum and those at the low income end of the spectrum. And so rising inequality is a problem because it's making our society less fair. It's making circumstances beyond your control have more influence on what you can achieve. And Canada has long been known as the social mobility, uh, a place of social mobility, and there's lots of research and recent research from Miles Korak to explain that uh, and show that to be true in the 1980s. But it isn't a dream for everyone, this social mobility. There are the haves and the haves not. They share different circumstances. For the haves, those circumstances are an advantage, meaning they do get ahead indeed. The opportunity equation is working for them. For the have-nots, it's not. They're not getting ahead. And more recent research that uh, is about to be published looking at social mobility demonstrates that. So, before we start looking at some of the data, I want to hold a little poll, although I'm saying that it's actually hard for me to see out there. So put your hand up if you think the next generation is going to be better off compared to you, looking at that question. Thinking about your overall quality of life, do you think the next generation will be better off? Those who say yes, better off. Well, like, like, like three, I think. Okay, that's low. <laughs> How about worse off? Well more than 50% and about the same. 
numerically around 10, I'm going to say. So this is what our research showed. So this room is even more uh, pessimistic than the research showed. <laughs> but this research is also uh, four years old. And I'm going to say the pessim pessimism that you're demonstrating today is actually probably what we would find out there uh, in a random sample as well. Maybe not quite so negative, because we here study these issues and we know a lot about them. Um, but uh, the point here is that in our, in our study of a random sample, over 50% of the population thought the next generation was going to be worse off. And that's a pretty, that then was a pretty stark finding. And uh, more research, more uh, poll research suggests that it is going to be worse today. And this is kind of why. This is the new data. Not everyone in the GTA, as I've already argued, is getting a successful start in life. Young adults today, in the GTA particularly, are more disadvantaged than ever before. So this figure shows um, uh, changes in income, uh, average income over time for three different age groups. You can see the age groups, the uh, 35 to 64, what we call mid-aged adults, for those of us on the upper end of that, um, 25 uh, to 34, which we call the, the younger workers, and then uh, people who are 65 and over. And I want to focus on the darker, the darker lines there, the average, the ages 25 to 34. So for the Canada data, you can see that their income actually went down over the period of the study from 1980 uh, all the way up to uh, 2005, and then had a little upswing. But when we look at Peel Region, City of Toronto, York Region, our city region, it's not the same picture at all. We see a downward decline of incomes for uh, younger workers. And we see uh, a decline for, for some of the mid-age workers, but an upward swing uh, for them, uh, at least in the city of Toronto and New York region. And basically what we're seeing is that young people today are, in each of these regions, earning less in all three regions than they did in 1980. These are in constant dollars, so these are comparable dollars here. But not only that, the gap between what they're earning as this cohort, cohort starting out compared to the cohort above them in the mid-age group is getting bigger. And that's a problem. It's a problem because, of course, we would expect young people to earn a bit less than people who are established in their careers. That's natural. But they don't have the same opportunities that the cohort ahead of them had. The labor market has changed. In the past, people like me, uh, I entered the labor market at a time of crisis as well, uh, but I, I, I got over it. Uh, because the crisis ended, things got better, and we all had access to jobs and opportunities that were going to help us build a better life. My parents had the same experience. Um, but my stepkids didn't have that experience, and many of the young people in this room are not going to have that experience. Our labor market has more precarious jobs in it, and so not only are young people starting off further behind, they do not have the same uh, opportunity for quality jobs that their previous generations did in order to catch up. So we don't know this for sure, but we can assume this is going to be a long-term trend, and it's going to have an impact on social mobility. Do we want to wait for 30 years or 20 years to see that data? Or do we want to make some educated guesses that this is where we're headed? and try to do something about it now. Okay, let's have another little poll. Many people are disadvantaged because of their background and have to work harder than others of equal basic talent to overcome the obstacles they face. Who agrees with that statement? Wow, um, at least 60, 70%. Who disagrees with that statement? No one. And um, the rest either don't know or don't want to play this little game. <laughs> and here's the answer from our study. Uh, again, this is the same study as previously. So nearly 80% of people agreed with that statement. That's a pretty terrible outcome, actually. I don't know what else to say about it, except that it's, 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 not, a, it's not a good uh, outcome. It tells us that a belief in fairness is actually lacking among our, our residents here. And this might be why. 
So this is the chart uh, for Canada for immigrants, and I'm going to show you the charts for Peel, Toronto, and York as well separately. Um, but let's just look at this one first. This is divided into uh, four, four different um, groupings of immigrants and then the Canadian-born in the black line at the end. You can see the Canadian-born line, um, you know, a bit slow in the first three decades of this study, uh, and then it speeds up rather rapidly uh, towards the end there. But it's not the same for immigrants. It goes down, and there's a bit of a recovery coming up for the first three, uh, well, for all three cohorts at the national level. But if you look at what's happening, let's focus only on the immigrants of 20 years and plus here. In 1980, they were almost level with the Canadian-born population overall. Very, very close. But by 2015, they were quite far behind. When we look at what's happening in our city region, this is Peel, Toronto, and York. It's pretty shocking. I'll put it back on Toronto because I assume most people here are in Toronto, and I'm just going to give you a couple of figures. Immigrants in Peel who had been in Canada for 10 to 19 years earned $48,800 in 1980, but only $40,400, constant $2015, by the way, in 2015. For Toronto, 1980, 43,100. 2015, 40,200. For York, 56,000. 2015, 45,500. So they're earning less than they did, but the gap between them and what's happening uh, to Canadian-born populations is just dramatically wider. I mean, you, you can only look at that far right line and think, what the heck is going on here? That can't possibly be true, can it? But it is. One more. Oh, I forgot there's all these slides. One more poll. Last one, I promise. In Toronto, hard work and determination are no guarantee that a person will be successful. Agrees. Mm, not, maybe not even 50%. It's hard to tell. How about disagrees? Only a couple. Don't knows? Not playing? Okay. This is the data. So um, you were a bit more optimistic than the, the data from, 20, from our study in 2015. Um, but I think you might be getting tired of the polling game. <laughs> so, but this is what it showed. Um, nearly three quarters of people agreed with the statement. And again, I mean, it's a real challenge to this whole concept our belief in fairness in society today. And again, this maybe is why. Because what people are really expressing there as a perception is turning out to be true in data as well. This is the data for racialized groups compared to uh, white, uh, white, white racialized populations compared to the white population. And we conclude from this that the racial divide in the GTA has reached a historic high. I don't think I need to explain the graphs uh, anymore. I think they're pretty clear. Even at the Canadian, all, all Canada level, we see what is really an enormous gap emerging over the period of this study from 1980 to 2015. With other data, we could see that that was a little bit more evened out from the averaging effects. But here it's not. And then when we look at the city of Toronto, again, can that be true? And the reality is that it is. And if there's one thing that this study has done, it's been able to name the experience that so many people, that 50% of the population in our city know and feel and experience. And so it's, it's an unignorable issue, as we say at United Way, that we just cannot continue to put to the side. So, we conclude then that the opportunity equation is indeed working, but only for some, not for all. And it's young people, immigrants, racialized people, and I haven't shown you the data, but women as well, who are seeing that it's their circumstances, things that are beyond their control again, that are barriers to the success in the GTA. They have to work harder than others to get ahead. And so what's driving these changes? 
Well, lots of things, of course, but a major part of this has to do with the labor market and the growth of precarious employment. And as luck would have it, you know, we've done a lot of work on that too over the last eight years. So we've done these three reports uh, in collaboration with another university, um, although there are lots of people from U of T who were involved as well. Uh, and through it, we've been able to name what precarious work looks like, uh, identify how it's impacting people and keeping people trapped once they fall into it. And then in 2018, uh, we stopped to do a little assessment of what the difference was between 2011 and 20, end of 2017 data that we had, this was survey data, to try to understand, well, what happened in this growing economy? Because despite what we might hear in the news, the economy did in fact grow between 2011 and 2017, quite a lot. Um, and we had more prosperity. And we did, because this chart tells us that we did. This chart tells us that by 2017, 55.9% uh, of the working population in Greater Toronto and Hamilton area had secure standard employment relationships. So these are good secure jobs with benefits, long term, all those things that many of us in this room know, many of us in this room don't know either. Others in this room are going to be in the purple category or even the grey category. Um, so that's a good news story, actually, overall. But behind it is not quite what we expected to see. Wages didn't really go up. And you can see even from this chart that those in the dark gray area, those who are in the deeply uh, precarious jobs, hasn't changed at all. And when we look at it from the point of view of who in those groups got ahead, we can see and look at the little asterisks on the side on the numbers column. Those are the ones that are statistically significant. Many of you will know what that means. They're the ones we can trust the data on particularly. Um, it was white men and women and racialized men with university degrees that got ahead. Everyone else showed some improvement, but it wasn't statistically significant, so we're not putting too much weight on that. Uh, and indeed, racialized women with a university degree showed some decline. But again, not statistically significant. So we won't put too much weight on that, even though that's what we know people are feeling sometimes. But another way to look at it is with our employment uh, precarity index, a 10-point index that looks at uh, 10 characteristics of how, uh, what your work experience is like and determines uh, whether you're precarious or not. And again, the same three groups get ahead, white men and women with university degrees and racialized men with university degrees. Everyone else shows some improvement, but again, not statistically significant. And this, sorry, is why. You can see again that the three groups at the top are the three groups with the yellow dots that had some improvement in uh, you know, half or nearly half of those 10, 10 characteristics on the employment precarity index. The others didn't. And if you look at the bottom line for all workers, when, it, when you look at it as a whole group, it looks like lots has improved, just like we saw. 55.9% of the labor market are now in standard employment relationships. But actually, it's only part of the labor market. And it's the same part of the labor market that our income data tells us we're already doing well and continued to do well, in fact, improved as a result of an improving economy, while everyone else stayed the same or got worse. So what do we do about it? Well, at United Way, of course, we've published all these reports. Uh, as luck would have it, I've been around for most of that time, uh, in fact, for all of that time. Uh, and so we've been able to really think about these reports together and come up with a, a framework for how we think about what the recommendations are. We talk about ensuring, uh, ensuring everyone can participate in society because the new data tells us that if we don't face this problem head on, and if we don't acknowledge it as an actual unignorable issue, now, we're simply not going to make any progress. The next bucket talks about how we help people get ahead in the meantime while we try to figure this out and figure out who we want to be as a society. And we talk about things like investments in the groups that are facing barriers and spe specific workforce development type approaches, improved job quality, updated employment standards, and renewed EI and uh, thinking about income bridging programs. And in the third, we're talking about how we make life more affordable for everybody. Everybody will benefit from this, not just those who are, who are at the, bearing the burden of these trends in our society. More affordable housing, uh, making sure that we pair housing with transit development, expanding childcare, 
uh, and providing supplemental health benefits to all. But I'm not going to go into the recommendations um, because the most important thing to know about the recommendations is exactly what Matty said at the beginning, that they are all about collaboration. Even when we're talking about improving things like the Employment Standards Act, we cannot rely on government or even ask a government to do it on its own. All of us have to play a role in pursuing that, whether we're pursuing it as advocates, whether we're doing it in our own practice, uh, or, or whether, whether we're uh, there experiencing it and, and helping push along uh, the quality of jobs through, through the regulatory frameworks. Um, likewise, thinking about workforce development systems requires everyone to be there with a new integrated collaborative uh, frame that will help us get to a new level. And so I wanted to provide very quickly just one example uh, of work that we're doing with that in mind. Many of you know our Building Strong Neighborhoods strategy. It's been around for a while. We've been working on it for over 10 years, but we've just renewed it just last summer around what we want to do next. And the first two are really continuing what we do, those investments in community, investments in residents, the advocacy that goes behind them. But the third is around innovation. And innovation uh, can be a, a no word, a nonsense word, and even a dirty word sometimes. Uh, here, we hope it's the right word. Uh, it's about how we work more together uh, to be able to uh, promote what we're now calling inclusive local economic opportunity. And so we've devised an initiative that from the outset relies on and will only succeed if we are successful in getting everyone to the table to work on it with us. And so that's what we've been trying to do. We've, I'm gonna show you the timetable. Uh, we, we've been doing work with communities for 10 years. We have a pretty good sense of what the community tells us they want and what we tacitly know and understand uh, they need. Uh, and so what we didn't have a good sense of is what the corporates are willing to put on the table for us in this, in this bargain. So we've started our work with a corporate leadership table, which is just completing its work uh, and is going to move on to a multi-sector leadership table. Here, we will be not, uh, forcing marriage is not the right way of uh, putting it. Um, we are going to invite uh, the players to come together to work with us. What we want to do is develop shared action plans. We have a corporate action plan now. We want to create a, mul a multi-sector table action plan. And from that, we think there are complementary action plans. And I think the key thing to think about then is how do we make all these action plans work together? To work together so that all roads will lead to opportunity. Governing cities in the 21st century has to be about multi-sector collaboration. We do a lot of it, but we have to do way more of it. We actually have to do it a lot better than we're doing it. And I will admit we are no pros at this ourselves. We are learning and experimenting as we go along. And we have to do it every time. We have to stop thinking that one sector can do one thing and one sector can do another thing. They can't. We all need to play a role, and our roles are different and uh, change, but we all have to be there. And at the heart of every goal behind everything we do needs to be this, that all roads in everything we do, everything we plan, everything we pay for, every transit line we build, even every road we build, all roads, not should or must, but simply all roads do lead to opportunity. And that's our goal. Thank you. Shalene, thank you. What a uh, thought-provoking and in many ways uh, sobering uh, talk about uh, the state of our city, uh, but also inspiring about uh, how the future can be shaped uh, through collaboration. Uh, in listening to your talk, I took away the, uh, uh, the key idea that especially our young people are at a moment of great disadvantage, that they are starting uh, further behind uh, and that they're moving into a world of greater uh, precarity in terms of employment. Uh, and that this poses great challenge for uh, their uh, future and for the prosperity of our cities. And the, the inspiration uh, from your talk comes in terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of the, the notion of collaboration, the idea of collaboration being at the core of how we're going to address uh, this issue, these issues of uh, inequality. Uh, 
and how working together is going to uh, lead us on the road towards uh, towards these better solutions. So thank you uh, very much for this uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, initial uh, talk, which leads right into our next, uh, our first panel, which is focusing on contemporary governance, creativity, perseverance, and possibility. Uh, the moderator for this panel is uh, Sarah Sharma. Sarah is Associate Professor of Media Theory and Theory at the Faculty of Information and Communication Technology at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, Her, and also the McLuhan Centre for Culture and Technology at the University of Toronto. Her research and teaching focuses on the relationship between technology, time, and labour, with a specific focus on issues related to gender, race, and class. She's the author of In the Meantime, Temporary Morality uh, and Cultural Politics, and Sarah is currently uh, working on a new book, The Sexit, which explores the relationship between gender, new technology, and practices uh, of exit and withdrawal. Sarah, I'll turn it over to you to introduce uh, the panel. Hello. We're actually just getting our mics on over there, so I think Nasma is going to be running down here right away. Um, I'm happy to introduce this next panel. I'm actually going to introduce the speakers uh, one by one as they come up, and they're going to be doing short five to seven minutes light, uh, lightning talks, and then we are going to hear from them through a moderated question and answer. But I don't want to call up Nasma unless she's... Is she... Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce Nasma Ahmed. She's a technologist and community organizer based in Toronto. And Nasma is currently the director of the Digital Justice Lab. And their mission is to build towards a more just and equitable digital future. She has extensive experience working alongside the public service and the nonprofit sector. She focuses on technology capacity building. She's also been an open web fellow with Mozilla and Ford. And I'd like to welcome Nasma now. And we'll follow after with Greg Cook and Juan Carlos Rodrigo Camacho. So welcome up, Nasma. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm feeling a little bit sick, so I'm sorry if my voice cuts out. How's everyone feeling this morning? Good? Yes, bright and early, ready for the day. OK. Uh, so my name is Nesma Ahmed. I am the director of the Digital Justice Lab, uh, which focuses on building a more just and equitable digital future. I know, broad mission. Uh, don't know how we're going to do that, but that's part of the work. Um, I want to tell you a little story that comes with a bunch of little tiny stories. Um, I'm a huge fan of public transit. I was raised in Scarborough, and my understanding of the landscape was through uh, the TTC and the buses that I took. So I knew the 54 Lawrence bus, and that's how I experienced Lawrence, Lawrence Avenue, um, or the 133 Nielsen bus, and that's how I got home. And I remember, actually, during one of the elections, one of the questions that I had uh, for the members who were running was, what was the smelliest station on the RT line? The reason why I asked that question is, if you've actually rode the RT line, you definitely know the smelliest station on the RT line, which is Midland, by the way. So <laughs> I tell that story because just a couple of weeks ago, um, I was running to catch the GO train, and I realized I had no money on my Presto card. And I dealt with something that I think is going to become more familiar to all of us. The machine's not working, and me not being able to actually put money on my card. Uh, which then led to me missing my GO train. And I say this because I have those moments, because I work in the digital space, of uh, being like, darn, digital transformation. I wish I could just use a token or something else, because none of this is working right now. Um, I say that story because technology is clearly shaping and shifting the way we exist in our society today. Um, my focus is on really knowledge translation. How can people kind of understand the impact of technology that isn't grounded in shame of why you use the phones that you use or why you're sharing the photo that you're sharing, um, and really trying to figure out how can we build towards something that is more equitable and justice focused. And that's some hard work. And cities, in many cases, are the groundwork of how we experience uh, the datafication of our everyday lives. Uh, from how we move around using Google Maps, uh, if you use Google Maps, uh, to how we access public transit, to how we even start to access the food that we eat 
right, through the different applications that we use. And cities being the foreground of how we engage and interact with digital technologies comes with a lot of problems, a lot of problems that we don't necessarily know how to face. And I want to bring up a really wonderful quote from Shannon Mattern, who's a professor at the New School. And she has this really wonderful essay on the Places Journal, which talks about the concept of city as a computer. And she states, my original technology, paper and pen, uh, she states, our current paradigm, the city, as a computer, appeals because it frames the messiness of our urban life as programmable and subject to rational order. I think about that quote often because I'm often, I am asked to assist nonprofits as they engage in digital transformation or as they're trying to navigate technology and where they want to have an intervention. And when I mean intervention, that can be from anything from the future of work to digital security. And I think about this, about the messiness of urban life as programmable and subject to rational order. That is not the city that I want to experience. And as we think through the future of digital policy making, we're seeing the struggles that cities are facing. In the most recent days, actually, the last couple of weeks, uh, we saw San Francisco, the hub of digital transformation, where however you may identify that, actually put a ban on facial recognition usage with the city, within the city. Uh, this was you know, not the first of its kind, but one of you know, many cities that are trying to grapple with emerging technologies. And I state this because it is a ban as they figure out whether they want to use it, as they figure out what are the ramifications and what are the roles of legislators as they move forward. Because technologies, in many cases, as we relate to cities, is used in, is a mechanism of creating solutions, right? Of course, we need more data to understand our human life. And then we, with that data, maybe we can figure out that, of course, you know, racism exists. And of course, income inequality exists. There is this idea of constantly thinking of technology as a solution. Right? A solution for the bigger problems that exist today, which is actually the uncomfortable conversations of the structure of power, the income inequalities that exist, the lack of decent work, the crippling student debt. Right? These are all bigger conversations that we sometimes like to avoid because, hey, look at this shiny tool, technology. And so I say this because in broad strokes, because that's the, that's the place that we're in right now. Right. Of course, you want the artificial intelligence tool to make things faster. We want big data to understand the big issues that we're experiencing. But unfortunately, what we're facing right now is a conversation of values. And that's uncomfortable. And cities have to figure out how we govern or how we deal with governance structures in relation to the technologies that we use. I'd love to say that I know all the technologies that are used by the city of Toronto. But I do not. Um, and there are probably many tools that we could be possibly uncomfortable with, um, as recently uh, provided with the Toronto Police. Actually, the Toronto Police has been experimenting with facial recognition for the last year. And we may not actually realize how we feel about that. Um, and I say this is that technology policy is an opportunity for collaboration. We stated collaboration earlier today, but I repeat it again because we don't necessarily know what we're doing. And I'm going to say that honestly. People are trying to come up with solutions all the time. We don't necessarily know what we're doing. And this is one of the opportunities that we can actually work together to figure out, hey, do we want the absolute datification of our everyday lives? Maybe not. Do we want to experience the messiness of urban life? Probably. But also, how are we going to build towards something that is most, more just and equitable? And unfortunately, technology is not our sole solution. And you know, I am often the bearer of bad news about that because I end up bringing conversations around power and wealth and it makes people feel uncomfortable. But that's the conversation that needs to be had because technology in many cases replicates the existing systematic inequalities that we experience today. And in that, cities are in the forefront. And I repeat that again, cities are in the forefront of how we experience it, which allows for projects like Sidewalk Toronto to exist, right? It allows them to exist in a way that makes it a really wonderful option for us, even if it might not be the case. And part of that is because of efficiencies and innovation. And we need to push back against that as much as we possibly can, because that is not the future that I expect for myself. 
And I'd say that that's not the future we'd all want to have. So, oh, stop. So thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you. Hey, these are really big ideas, said really fast. <laughs> so I'm going to welcome the next speaker, Greg Cook. Um, Greg Cook has a background in history and political science from the University of Toronto. But Greg has been, most importantly, a drop-in and outreach worker in downtown Toronto for almost 12 years and also at Sanctuary since 2009. Greg partners with other community groups and agencies to advocate for more just and equitable policies related to housing in Toronto. He's on the steering committee of the Shelter and Housing Justice Network, and he volunteers for the Toronto Homeless Memorial. Um, Greg was part of a group of activists who agitated for a coroner's inquest into the deaths of people without housing. You might recognize him from also many Now articles, um, in Toronto Now articles, and also two documentaries he's worked on. One is called Bursting at the Seams, and it's about the housing crisis, and another one is called What World Do You Live In? And it's about police brutality. So I welcome Greg. Thank you. Deadpan jokes. Is he being serious? Gentle eyes. Thoughtful. Loyal to a fault. It's December 2017, two days before Christmas. Dallas and his partner share a small bachelor apartment. It's crammed with four to five guests. Dallas's friends are in crisis. They don't have a place to stay each night. No bed of their own, no door to lock for privacy and safety. Even bad options are not available. The shelters are full. So Dallas and his partner are extending care and love to their friends. Tragically, in the midst of negotiating a crowded apartment, one of the guests leaves the stove on. There is a fire. No one is physically hurt. However, the apartment needs to be renovated and the landlord's, landlord tells them they are evicted. During the next two weeks, the temperature plummets to minus 20, 20 degrees Celsius for days at a stretch. Forced to sleep on the street, Dallas and his partner get pneumonia. Both end up in a hospital emergency departments. Physical symptoms are treated. Expensive hospital beds are deemed too valuable for a sick indigenous couple. They are discharged out into the cold despite our resigned pleas. Their health deteriorates and soon after they are back in the emergency department. Beyond the physical violence of shivering in sleeping bags, there is no doubt the psychological violence of intergenerational trauma that is pushed to the surface. The very real reenactment of childhood apprehension, loss of home, broken attachments. The ongoing horrors of colonization and displacement. It took almost a year for Dallas to find relatively stable housing again. Richard Wagamese expounds on the Anishinaabe phrase for all my relations in English as, we live because everything else does. I think a good framing of what I learned from Dallas and what he prioritized in the face of overwhelming violence is the belief that we are all connected. We belong to each other. Dallas fought for the lives of all his relations, those he knew and loved. Sadly, Dallas died recently. He was only 44. From my limited perspective, the intersection, intersecting forces of colonization, an opioid epidemic, and the deepening housing crisis were the primary culprits. Our city excels at providing zoning policies and supporting a mortgage regime that facilitates expanding profit margins for developers. Inextricably linked to this expertise is proficiency with which it displaces thousands. We live in a city where home as a place of life is a distant dream and instead home exists as a site of profit. In a world where we all are connected, regimes that build zones of extraction also facilitate zones of exclusion. Whether that's oil extraction in the Alberta tar sands or financial extraction in rental housing neighborhoods like Parkdale and Moss Park. What would governance in cities like Toronto look like if City Hall Queen's Park, and Parliament Hill were accountable to each of its residents, especially to those pushed to the margins? What if we established policies that prohibited government priorities from being driven by the investment portfolios of developers like Menkes and Great Gulf? What if we graded governments on their ability to shrink the gulf between the rich and the poor instead of their ability to attract corporations like Sidewalk Labs and Google? 
are those in our midst labeled as a creative class. On December 6 of 2017, John Tory and City Council vote against a motion to open the Moss Park and Fort York armories for Toronto's homeless. A couple weeks earlier, the Community Development and Recreation Committee had put forward a motion to open the armories immediately and expand the shelter system by 1,000 beds as soon as possible. I was in council on December 6. We offered sound statistics and clear rationale for why the city should declare a state of emergency. In knowledge, its shelter system was full and take emergency measures to open the armories. City council refused to listen. As a result, people like Dallas, who had very limited resources, were forced to do what the city failed to do, open his door to those in crisis. This policy decision precipitated one crisis in the midst of a much bigger shelter and housing crisis. On January 2, 2018, activists like OCAP won a temporary battle and forced the city government to open the armories. Still, the situation keeps getting worse. Alessandro Busa in The Creative Destruction of New York City writes, the truth is cities are increasingly being built for the rich to invest in rather than regular people to live in. Consequently, tens of thousands in this city alone are being displaced. Basic necessities like housing and enough food to eat are being taken away. Basic needs like privacy and safety disappear in the face of soaring rental costs. In the last 10 years, the cost of rent in Toronto has more than doubled. OW rates, Ontario disability rates, and minimum wage has definitely not doubled. OW recipients are 62% under the poverty line. ODSP recipients, 40% under. One million people in Ontario alone are on OW and ODSP. Judith Butler in Precarious Life asks, what counts as a livable life and a grievable death? Why don't we treat home as a collective good? What policy decisions in the past decades have contributed to creating a real estate market that's financialized housing and decimated the lives of so many? According to Liliana Farha, who was a special rapporteur on housing for the UN, global real estate is now worth 217 trillion, 36 times the value of all gold ever mined. It makes up 60% of the world's assets and the vast majority of that wealth, roughly 75% is in housing. In the face of such a hegemonic regime, what will it take to live in a way so that everything else stays alive? What policy and funding changes can cities make to ensure our neighborhoods, our friends, aren't dying on the streets? I am part of the Shelter and Housing Justice Network in, the, in Toronto. Two demands that we have made to City Hall are, one, take emergency measures, add 2,000 new shelter beds or transitional housing units this year. Two, increase investment in rent gear to income and build a minimum of 5,000 new rent gear to income housing units per year. I miss Dallas. I ask myself, what does it mean to grieve him well? I'm challenged by the idea that we live because everything else does. Thank you. And our third lightning speaker is Juan Carlos Rodriguez Camacho, and I say that he's just received his PhD at Boise, and so we should congratulate him on this too. Um, and on the topic of indigenous ethics and health research, um, <clears throat> So Juan has conducted research with indigenous communities in Canada and Latin America, exploring ways to create and sustain respectful and supportive relations between indigenous communities and government. He's also a rural registered teacher, internationally trained psychologist and university lecturer. Um, in Canada, he's collaborated specifically with the Native Child and Family Services of Toronto, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, and also the University of Toronto and McMaster. Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Sharma, for this presentation. And well, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the School of City for this invitation and all presenters and all the public that is just attending today and also the people who are following us online. Um, in, in my position as uh, indigenous person, indigenous from uh, the uh, northwest of the Andes, of the Muiscas families, so I work, so many, many years ago I started this journey of understanding uh, the inequalities between indigenous communities and non-indigenous communities. And my topic of research is trying to 
improving, uh, to, to improve health with, by, and for indigenous research, indigenous communities. So by doing that, um, probably you, you may know that uh, despite millions and millions of dollars invested every year in health research and health services, uh, the help for indigenous communities is still considered a social crisis. So what is this happening? So what does it mean? So we, we saw this on the data. Seems like there is a structural system that is perpetuating the harms. And um, by doing that, probably I turn around the, the focus of research from the indigenous communities as a subject of research towards the system. And I ask uh, 2,200 research, researchers in Canada to share their experience of doing health research and moving the systems for indigenous communities. So right now we know a little bit more about the field of indigenous health research. What does mean? Who is doing what, when, why, and how, and where? And also we know a little bit more about the barriers and uh, strengths of the practice of indigenous health research. Why is uh, the ethics of indigenous health research is interesting? It is because it is recognized that there is a connection between the knowledge that we have, public policy, government services, and service delivery, and uh, cultural um, um, configuration of the cities and the, the, of the country in general. So by challenging the knowledge that we have, we are trying to move and disrupt the system of perpetuating harms. So how this thing is working? Probably harms are being reproduced without intention. But when we apply a new technology on indigenous communities, so we are creating, again, an inequality process because of the access to technology, because of the education, and because there is a lot of previous inequalities that prevent indigenous people just to access and to take advantage of this new benefit. Then, um, probably, uh, I'm for the interest of this um, meeting, I'm going to share only three main ideas. The first. The first main idea is that probably we know, and it was shared before, that we need to include indigenous communities in the decision and in the collaboration and in the, the building process of new health services. And saying that, uh, it is important to design processes where indigenous communities are lead, are the leaders of the process of indigenous services. That point is very easy to say, but very difficult to, to achieve because of the inequalities and because the, the dynamics that are behind and inside the government and inside the cities. We know everybody we're trying to invite people to collaborate, but in the moment of to share power and to take decisions is very hard. So then, how we are going to be a realistic uh, worker, thinking on the dreams and, and looking for this ideal city, a modern city that will include everybody. So the second idea is that definitely this new knowledge that we need we don't, uh, is going to help us to understand what, uh, what we need to do in terms of our methods, in terms of our concepts, in terms of our, our ideas about how to challenge the system that we are managing, the system that we currently work uh, and we, the system that provides services. So this new knowledge definitely is not going to be inside the epistemology that we know. It's not there. You can find it. You can look at it, and you can, you can find ideas of this epistemological framework and the framework that we use to apply for our current societies. 
So then the proposal is just to move away of this kind of what I call uh, complicated versions of society, where the systems are integrated, but integrated in a different way, versus a complex, dynamic, and learning systems. One thing that I learned from indigenous communities in Canada and from my community is the, the main concept of humility. We don't, we don't have the all answers, and we can't have it. If we are trying to design a, a big macro process that could fit the needs of everybody, it's not going to work. That is why we need to create a learning system co-built or co-collaborative with indigenous communities. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just make a few comments and then um, ask them a question and then open it up for a question if there's time. And um, one of the things um, I just wanted to point out that was, well, thank you, first of all, for all of that. Um, one of the really important things that I think came out of all three of these talks was this sense of um, wanting the messiness of living in a city. Um, and the complexity of living in a city, but with justice, or to think about it in terms of we can have the messiness of city life and still live in a just and equitable world. And that's sort of the complex scenario we find ourselves in. As Nasma said, we don't want to live in a programmable city, and we don't want to um, sweep everything under the rug under this idea of some sort of utopia of a city where everything's working. We have to, some, what Juan was mentioning, we have to recognize the complex dynamics of all this. And so what all three talks seem to do and remind everybody is there's an interrelationship between technology, transit, food, health, how we sleep, where we sleep. And this is about governing what's at stake and not necessarily stakeholders. It's like changing the conversation from what's at stake. And what's at stake are really like bodily embodied things for residents in the city. And so, um, so thank you for that. And with that in mind, I, was, I wanted to ask you, like, we can learn from other cities, but at the same time have to recognize the site specificity of Toronto, right? The history, who's here, what's happening, who's invested, or who's not invested. So I was going to ask my question for all of you to think about um, and respond to would be, what important initiatives do you see in other cities that Toronto can learn from? Like recognizing like really, like Naswa, you mentioned San Francisco, but I'm sure you have other examples, but is there an initiative in another city related to governance that you think Toronto can learn from in a very specific way? So each of you. Yeah, I can actually uh, go first. Um, one of my favorite initiatives is actually the anti-eviction mapping tools. Um, it's out of San Francisco, but also other areas like LA, uh, New York, Baltimore. And the reason why I share that example is that it came out of uh, the absolute fi financialization of the Mission District in San Francisco with obviously the increase in rent um, and a bunch of other factors uh, in the Mission District. And what they noticed was they couldn't clearly figure out who were purchasing, like who was purchasing the land, um, who was, you know, like the landlords, what was happening, what is the mass, like what was the number of people who were being displaced. Um, and so it was a mixture of community mapping and also like open data um, open data tools to be able to kind of really hyper specify like what was happening in that area. Um, and I think of that example as a good one that mixes like technology, but also like right now what they were trying to figure out was who's being evicted, right? And putting tools together to figure that out. And that's one of my favorite tools. I know people have tried to do that in Toronto, but there's a lot of difficulty that comes with doing that here. Um, and so I'd say that is, check it out, it's online. Okay, great. Um, I think there's a lot of really neat ideas. One um, that is starting to happen in Toronto is um, the city being involved in supporting the purchasing of community land trusts. Mm, yeah. um, so I know that's happening in, in cities from San Francisco to Jackson, Mississippi, um, to um, uh, this is, I think Burlington and Vermont, um, where they have quite an extensive program. Um, in Toronto, the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust just recently bought a building. 
And the idea is to take off, um, housing off the kind of the real estate market and put it into the hands of the local co community. Um, I personally would, would think it'd be, again, I think collaboration and what would it look like to, for, for the city of Toronto to actually turn over a bunch of its land to uh, the local indigenous community mm -hmm. and offer it as a community land trust to offer affordable housing for um, indigenous communities in Toronto. So yeah, um, now I remember two examples. There, there, um, it's a group of uh, initiatives that uh, create the programs where the, the indigenous healer is working with the, the medical doctor mm -hmm. together <laughs> and delivering service together for the, for the community, for the population. It's very successful because um, then it's trying to break the um, isolation and uh, the difference and the dislocation between these two different kind of knowledge. But also in British Columbia, I think that they were ahead and they created, I think it's the first ministry of mental health and addictions in Canada. And they are very uh, interested in creating uh, a system that is uh, completely uh, not only involving, but led by indigenous communities. And they are very powerful. And then probably if, uh, if we uh, have the opportunity to learn more about their experience, I think that in Ontario there are some kind of conversations in the, lab, in the government just to create a ministry, a, a similar ministry here, that will give us the opportunity to, to create new and innovate a little bit on, in terms of health services. I think we're going to open up to see if there's any questions from the audience that I don't know where the mics are. I can't see. Oh, there's one. Yep. Oh, there's one. Oh, I think it's down there. Am I going? Oh, no. Yeah? Hi. <laughs> Um, I just had a question, um, and I'm wondering what the panelists thought. So Joseph Stieglitz is leading a group at the OECD now looking at national government rather than cities at going beyond GDP. Um, you know, we talked about metrics, and I'm just wondering what you thought about the notion of cities actually using well-being um, as, like, a central guiding, organizing framework. Um, uh, I'll leave it at that. It's kind of a big, broad question. She's asking about well-being. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. It's, it's a little bit difficult to understand, but yes, well-being is a complete uh, different paradigm that the concept of health. Well, health is mainly based on the social definition of the biological m model, but it's, it's a social construction. It's not only biological, kind of uh, this conversation there. Well-being involves kind of holistic perspective of uh, health. And with this holistic pers perspective, we understand that health is not only, a, is not only about being sick, is also about housing, it's also about poverty, it's also about income, it's also about community relationships, it's, al it's also about how you balance individual and community health, individual and community well-being. So those, those areas are definitely uh, changing uh, the way that we uh, understand health services. Yeah, I was going to ask Nasma too if you would speak on the relationship between technology and well-being because I think that's central to some of the work that you're doing as well in the city. Yeah, I I always find it I, I don't necessarily work within the space of like you know health policy in any in any way, um, but for technology, a lot of the work that we've been doing actually with young folks is around digital privacy and it's. Uh, oh. love technology. Um, yeah, technology and its impact on young folks, and specifically moving away from the conversation of shame. 
so we've obviously had multiple iterations of this, right? So it's around video games, and it was around TV. Um, and so, you know, we're clearly seeing that there is an impact, obviously, on mental health and well-being uh, in relation to, like, usage. Uh, but that's also how people build their communities. And so there's this constant uh, misalignment in many cases and difficulties that come with having a conversation around technology and how much you love it, but also the fact that it's increasing your anxiety, right? Like, I personally try to get off a lot of social media platforms because I understand how it makes me move around the world. Right? And so we're constantly dealing with these contentions, and it gets harder when we have uh, the lack of public space, actually. Um, there's a lot of really good work about the declining public space and the, the pushing towards you know, technologies as a mechanism of building community because of the lack of public space, because of the over-policing in certain environments that push us towards digital environments. And so it's, a, it's, it's all connected to our physical realities, which is, which is hard, right? Because we want to be able to play outside in the park, but also if you're in an area that is heavily surveilled, your family might feel more secure you being at home, and so you'll just be on your phone, right? And so this, this all connects into like what do we want as well-being, as residents. Um, and I also think that we have a lot of really good metrics. And unfortunately, you know, people or you know, the powers that be and the governance structures that we have right now, you know, we're not actually reallocating resources in, a, in an appropriate manner. I think there's a lot of really great solutions out there. And unfortunately, you know, we aren't building towards those solutions, especially solutions that are provided by equity-seeking groups. Can I say yeah. something? So, yeah, mm, so right now we are living in uh, and being pushed by um, two trends, at least two trends, big, big trends. <laughs> big data and artificial intelligence and machine learning. So then it seems like intelligent cities and the possibility mm -hmm. to, to create modern cities it's going to be based on the, our ability to manage data. So technology is not a good or wrong thing mm -hmm. per se. I mean, it's, 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 we know that it's about how we use technology. If the, the technology is going to help us to reduce these gaps, or if technology is going to be part of the equation in a negative way. So then we know exactly that. that. So now we can use artificial intelligence in the way that it support, the can support communities and support individuals, it would be fantastic. But this is the, the job that we need, to, we need to do. We need to work on that. It's a, it's a road that probably is not clear for right now. So then that is why we need to invite communities to this conversation. Well, if I'm hearing you, if you're suggesting even a, a, this relationship again between tech, transit, food, housing, community governance, is also about the allocation of resources, but also how we understand these things. So for example, these aren't these broad things that come into our communities. They're actually, they can be effective routes for change as well on a smaller scale. So, okay. Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's important to think through a networked approach, right? Like we clearly have different forms of knowledge knowledge keeping, right, awareness of how we exist in communities are so different in different areas. And so I think there's a need to kind of think through what are networked approaches to governance. We have that, obviously, in kind of open source platforms and technologies. But, you know, I think that there is, there is a lot of opportunity in not necessarily having a central form of power. Um, and that is something that is obviously debatable, but it, it's something that we have to think about moving forward. Because I think that you know, a smart city is a city where people are housed, right? A smart city is a city that people have decent work, right? And like that's that's what we should be pushing towards. And I think that the push around big data, artificial intelligence, yes, that could be a mechanism. I think in many ways to support the things that we care about. Um, but you know, right now we're in, in a contentious space. Right, where it's many in many use in many ways used against us, and we have to be honest about that as well. And so, you know, our, do we value that it is a bigger conversation? But I think a smarter city is a city in which we can be housed, fed, and taken care of, and is centered on our well-being. There's a question right there. Uh, I'm aware that uh, there are a number of areas in the city where Indigenous people are looking to have um, kind of a, uh, an indigenous community, um, getting away from the old idea that oh, we've got um, ghettos in, in, in ethnically based areas and, and seeing the, the strengths in um, 
organizing uh, one's community within a city. And given that um, there are a number of communities in the north uh, using analog platforms to uh, expand education and do democratic decision making through digital means. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you see um, expanding the scale of um, you know the, a small indigenous uh, community within a city um, and even maybe not in the GTA like uh, uh, we we know that uh, indigenous people have been moved off their land down to only two percent of the land base in Canada, and if reconciliation goes forward, um, would it be possible to envision, you know, indigenous cities? Okay. <laughs> Do any you want to? Well, um, it's very difficult to be homeless when you are in your own home. Mm. So I have to recognize that I am a visitor here in Canada. And these lands are indigenous lands. So indigenous cities, so some indigenous communities are living in cities, others no, they're just, just walking around and doesn't, doesn't live in cities. So the creation of, um, of indigenous um, groups and cities just protected. So actually, we, we, we have a project of housing, creating the perfect village. But it's, 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 a, it's a welcoming village for everybody. So I, 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 I visualize that, that the indigenous communities will be interested in integration instead of isolation. And in terms of the technology and the tools that we have in the technology, the t technology is, is, is great for many indigenous um, people who are living in the city. For example, they use Facebook to be connected with the community. And actually, the, the Facebook groups are just kind of very strong. And they create a sense of community that is lost because of the separation of the family. So, and everything depends on um, probably how we share and how we negotiate and how we, in somehow, the togetherness of building things together, the building things shared in somehow. That, that will be the question. Instead of uh, thinking like a protected spaces, we need to think about all Canada is a protected space. I'm going to ask Nosma and Greg a question following from this, and it's sort of a creative question. I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. <laughs> it's not terrible, don't worry. Um, but I think rather than ask um, you, like, for a solution or what the latest innovation might be, maybe to think about, and, and also in, with this sort of ethos of moving beyond the status quo in terms of governance, what would be a futuristic government service that you can imagine? like an ideal futurist government service that addresses some of these things, so. <laughs> um, I tend to think not too far ahead because. Yeah, of, what's the future, um, right? <laughs> so I, I, like, I think that we've been asking whether it's city government or like a, lo a lot of kind of responsibility is in government, I think. Um, they say, oh, that's the province's responsibility, that's the federal government's responsibility. Um, and so actually this is in our job to make sure that mm -hmm. people have basic necessities like food or housing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's something that the city of Toronto could do is actually work a lot harder at, at, at kind of very, I think they're starting to have to right now because of our current government situation. Um, but to actually really um, kind of set up a whole um, department to, to make sure that, that, that we're getting the tax revenue mm -hmm. and the necessities that we need as a city. Um, I don't think they do that nearly enough. And to kind of, I think city government is much closer to what's on the ground um, for, 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 for residents. And so, and so if, if, the, if the city government can kind of say, hey, we, we need a national housing strategy again, um, it's killing people. Or um, we need to make sure we have food security. Um, um, we need to address um, um, 
racism in our city. It's, it's causing a lot of damage. I really like your answer because it actually speaks to the things that should exist today, right? Like in honesty, right? Like it should exist today. We have the information that will allow, like we have the data sets that prove that, you know, racism kills, for example, or the income inequality. And like those are things that should exist today, which is the scary part about a lot of this work. Um, I think for me, if I was thinking about the future, um, I would really love for the city to run its own like internet infrastructure. Um, I've been really looking into internet infrastructure as a mechanism for like local economic development, um, and I, I do believe that you know it would be a really good opportunity for the city to think about that and navigate that. I know it was considered at some point, but um, I I think that would be super fascinating, um, especially. Uh, in a way of pushing for affordability of access. Uh, but un unfortunately, a lot of the future things that I think about right now are things that we should already have access to but do not have access to. And so, um, and that's actually, unfortunately, a very common trend when we're thinking about, for example, technology developments in cities. Um, a lot of what organizers have been saying multiple times across the US, for example, is that you know, one of the bigger issues is like lack of transparency and accountability. It's like all the things that we want to expect of our city governments, but unfortunately can't, right? Um, in all honesty. And so I would love for people to follow the rules that are set in place. That would be great. I think that would be a great future governance model is follow the rules that are set and also be able to be dynamic as we move forward. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have, to, oh, there's one, as long as it's a question, we have time for one more. Yes, right back there. I think it's, yeah, it's you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, we live in a place where um, there is displacement reality, uh, displace, displacement reality as a result of uh, vacancy decontrol, control. And um, just assuming that that continues um, and rooming houses and food banks in downtown um, continue to get priced out, um, you know, uh, just wanted to ask um, what you would like to see included in a national housing strategy, right? Um, it's a tough question, but um, Greg okay. proposed kind of emergency uh, shelters because that's uh, a crisis in reality, but sort of in the long term, what would you like to have included um, as a part of your recommendations? Uh, I think money right away. Um, we've been promised money, but it keeps not appearing. Um, for, for actual rent geared to ho um, income housing, um, a lot of, even the definition of affordable housing has been changed to 80% of market rent, which is not affordable if for, frankly, most people in Toronto, I don't think. Um, so uh, housing that's actually affordable um, that's being built. And, and it, we can do much better. Um, in, in the 70s and 80s, Canada was building um, 20 to 30,000 units of affordable housing every year. Um, we're not even close to that now. Uh, like Toronto, on average, builds maybe 500 units of affordable housing every year. It's just, just it's appalling, and it's affecting the lives of so many residents. Okay. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up um, for now to stay on time. But thank you to all these speakers, and thank you to all of you as well. Thank you, Jane. Okay, thank you to the panel. Um, there was such urgency in the recommendations and uh, uh, discussion, and I, I think that really uh, uh, helps frame the conversation around governance in the 21st century. So that brings us uh, to our first break. Uh, we now have 15 minutes uh, for refreshments. Um, the quiet room is in the back if anyone uh, needs it. The washrooms are down the hall just in the back. Uh, we will uh, adjourn now for 15 minutes and come back uh, at, at 11 uh, sharp uh, to get started with the next panel. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Okay, we're going to get started.
Okay, I'm pleased to introduce uh, the next uh, panel, which focuses on navigating the 21st century. Uh, and the moderator for this panel is Professor Miriam Lowe. Uh, Miriam Lowe is the Associate Director uh, for Educational Initiatives at the School of Cities. Um, and she's a professor of women and gender studies and associate director, um, uh, she's the, and the director of the African Studies program at the University of Toronto. Uh, professor Lowe's work encompasses the political economy and creative dynamism of African urban informal economies, uh, migration studies, female entrepreneurship, economic justice, and rights, uh, rights to livelihood, with a focus on the dynamics of urban transformation, urban governance, resilience, urban poverty, and inclusive urbanism. Professor Lowe is also engaged in collaboration with grassroots women's organizations, civil society networks, such as the West African Civil Society, and internal uh, international organizations such as uh, the United Nations uh, Women's Organization and uh, the United Nations Development Program. She has a PhD from uh, Cornell and she's held uh, fellowships at Oxford University and Georgetown University. Professor Lowe. Thank you, Maddie, for this very kind introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today and to moderate our second panel of the day, Navigating the 21st Century City. Um, and I am, it's a pleasure to introduce our distinguished um, panelists. And I would like also to let you know that uh, one of our panelists, Crystal Bassi, unfortunately had an emergency and could not be here. You can imagine. Uh, the gap we have, but we have panelists who will clearly help us navigate these conversations with your collaboration. And I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our panelists, starting with Sarah Huge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sarah Huge is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science, University of Toronto. Her research interests include urban politics, policy, and governance, water policy, and climate change policy. She focuses on understanding how political interests, institutions, and environmental problems interact at the urban scale and the social and environmental outcome they generate. Her research has been funded by Shirk, Connaught, and the government of Minnesota, and she has held fellowships at the U US Environmental Protection Agency and the National Center for Atmospheric Research. In 2013, she, has, she was named a Clarence and Stone Scholar by the Urban Politics Sections of the American Political Science Association. Her forthcoming book, congratulations, Sarah, <laughs> Repowering Cities, Examine the Governing Strategies City Governments Can and Do Use to Reduce Greenhouse Gas Emission in North America. Thank you, Sarah, for being here. And please. And our second speaker, uh, Jason Torn. Jason is a professional planner who leads the planning and economic development department at the city of Hamilton, Canada. He oversees a team of 800 staff working across multiple portfolio, including planning, building, development, engineering, transportation planning, parking, arts, culture, and economic development. Born and raised in Hamilton, Jason has been working in planning and community development his entire career. As a manager with the Ontario Growth Secretariat, Jason was one of the key architects of the province of Ontario Places to Grow initiative. As director of policy and planning for Metrolinx, Jason was one of the lead authors of the Buy Big Move, the regional transportation plan for the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Jason also worked as a planning consultant for communities across Canada and in Africa and Latin America as a partner and, prevent, and principal with the Toronto-based planning, architecture, and design firm, Planning Alliance. He has also worked for a wide range of non-governmental organizations, including the Bay Area Restoration Council, Bruce Trail Association, and Coalition on the, Niger, on the Niagara Escarpment. Jason is a passionate advocate of community-based planning, sustainable and inclusive development, and the creation of complete, vibrant cities. Most importantly, he's a proud Hamiltonian who is excited to be back working in his hometown. Welcome, Jason. Thank you for being here. And last but not least, Andrea Barak. Andrea Barak is the global head, sustainability and corporate citizenship at TD Bank Group. 
In this role, she's the lead champion for corporate social responsibility across the enterprise, ensuring the development of a best-in-class integrated strategy that is aligned to business objectives while creating positive social, economic, and environmental impacts in the community. Prior to coming to TD, Barack was the chief executive officer of the Ontario Trillium Foundation, providing strategic and operational leadership to a government agency that distributed over 120 million in public funding to the charitable and not-for-profit sector. She worked in healthcare administra administration for more than a decade, decade, focused on primary healthcare and community health. She's recognized for her expertise in making organization more effective by ensuring that systems are integrated and impact is both measured and assessed. Andrea earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology at the University of Guelph and a Master's of Health Science in Health Administration at the University of Toronto. She has also earned certificates in nonprofit management and governance from Harvard University's Business School and John Kennedy School of Government. In 2016, she was named in the Women's Executive Network Top 100 Most Powerful Women in the Trendsetter and Trailblazer category. Uh, in her volunteer life, Andrea is on the board of the Western Hemisphere of the International Planned Parenthood Federation and the chair of the Dean's Council for the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University. She's also a diversity fellow, mentors with the Greater Toronto Civic Action Alliance. Please join me for a round of welcome to our wonderful speakers. As we start our next panel, as we start our panel, uh, navigating the 21st century and city. So we have a range of perspective from a scholar, Sarah, um, Jason, who described himself as a tech bureaucrat, I also a policymaker, and Andrea, who representing the public, the private sector. Uh, we are going to engage in conversation where, but starting first with each of our panelists, giving us a brief overview or impact statement about what they want to share with us in the course of this conversation. So the next round of conversation will be led by the panelists and then we'll convene with a lively conversation on a, around a few set of questions and then we'll open the floor to you for Q&A. You also are a key member of this panel because we expect and welcome your active, lively engagement, your you know, provocations, your questions, your ruminations, your suggestions. So please, let's welcome the panels and start our, our conversation on governing cities in the 21st century. But, <laughs> but first, let me start with Sarah. Sarah, what would you like to start with, to share with us as a way of contextualizing our conversation today? Sure, great, yeah. thanks. Thanks so much for um, inviting me to be on the panel as well. And um, so as Miriam mentioned, a lot of my research the last four or five years has focused, well, probably more than that, has really focused on um, how cities can do and should, might address climate change. And um, I really come at it uh, from the perspective of city governments, right? There's been a lot of attention to the leadership city governments are, are providing in the arena of climate change, setting ambitious goals, um, kind of coming forward uh, with those when other levels of government aren't necessarily. Um, but for me, as somebody um, observing this and, and, and talking and, and trying to work with uh, decision makers, um, I think these ambitions raises many questions about, about governance in the 21st century um, as they might try to answer. So um, I think a lot of what I see uh, revealed in these, in these processes is this shift um, city governments everywhere, for sure, in Toronto and, and, and throughout North America are undergoing from uh, a role as a primarily uh, service provider um, to this kind of policy leader, convener, network manager, capacity builder. Um, and, and this shift is, is um, I think, obvious to many, but is, I think there's still some catch up um, that we're playing in terms of how exactly to navigate this role. Um, 
And there's a lot of reasons for this shift. There's economic imperatives behind this kind of leadership and innovation. Um, there's policy gaps being left by decentralization and uh, you know, kind of pullbacks at other levels. And there's also new demands that people have of their city governments um, that, are, that are initiating this shift as well. And so one thing I've been thinking about a lot is what this means for the, the sources and exercise of power in, in local government and at the local level, uh, where we typically think about um, kind of direct power or power over, power to regulate, power to formally um, uh, do things. But I think this shift is really going to require more attention to ideas of power with and power to, this kind of network governance that's already come up a couple of times. Um, and, and, and the other idea that, that this brings up for me is what um, has been called the, the iron law of urban politics and governance, which is this idea that um, pursuing an agenda, a collective agenda of some kind, requires the mobilization of resources and people commensurate with that agenda, equal to the ambitions of that agenda. And so to me, I think this is really the key task um, if city governments are going to lead this, um, this shift and, and lead this uh, transition, that that, could, that, that mobilization and, and collective work is really the key task of, of governance going forward. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Jason? So, yeah, I guess as, as was said in the introduction, I, I, I'm the bureaucrat on the panel. Um, and. Uh, I say that somewhat proudly as, as, as sort of a public servant and civil servant, but, it, but it's through that lens that I think about what is the, uh, what does governance look like in, in the 21st century city. And uh, uh, coincidentally, I came from a conference I was just at uh, last week. Uh, it was a conference called the Urban Futures Conference. It's the, <clears throat> the, the largest urbanism conference in Europe. Um, a number of uh, uh, heads of planning, uh, elected officials, mayors from all over European cities. And one of the conference themes at that, um, at that event was uh, around leadership and a new approach to decision making. Uh, and what the conference organizers called that thread, um, I thought was quite telling. They called it, authority was yesterday. Uh, and, and I quite like that. And, and, it, and when you think about it, it's a very powerful statement about what governance is gonna mean in the 21st mm -hmm. century, if authority was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in the planning world, we talk about um, a number of concepts. We talk about do-it-yourself urbanism. We talk about tactical urbanism and guerrilla urbanism and the co-created cities um, and other similar concepts. Um, all slightly different, but share a sort of a common theme around this idea, uh, this belief and this, this assertion that city building is a, is a collective responsibility and it's a collective right. Um, and it's, uh, you know, in, in other words, it's you know, it's no longer just the domain of, of, of bureaucrats and politicians, that it's something that's being opened up to, to many, many uh, decision makers. And I think that's got some powerful implications for how people in roles like mine, mm -hmm. um, members of council, people who are the traditional decision makers of cities, how they actually approach their work. Um, it means really taking a careful look at all of the structures that have been built up over generations, our, 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 our policies and processes and procedures and regulations and standards, and looking at those through the lens of um, how are we actually stepping back a bit now, creating some space, and, and not just supporting and facilitating the co-creators who are out there city building with us, uh, but also inviting that kind of, um, um, th those new decision makers in. Um, and. Uh, I think there's a number of reasons why that, that, that's a good approach to decision making in terms of the quality of decision making you get, in terms of the representation of, of decision makers that you get. Um, but also just speaking from a, from a city like my own, from, a city, from the city of Hamilton, there's just a basic necessi necessity in approaching decision making that way. Mm -hmm. um, Hamilton, like a lot of cities, especially the mid-sized cities around the world where uh, you don't necessarily have the, uh, the resources and the deep pockets to make a lot of, um, uh, to drive all the change that needs to happen just through, just through City Hall. I mean, Hamilton has done well in the, last, in the last few years. We're quite proud of kind of some of the transformation that's happened in our city. Uh, but I can tell you that if, if you're looking for what is that one grand big move of government that made it all happen, uh, you're not going to find it. You're not going to find a. You're not going to find a Guggenheim in Hamilton. You're not going to find a, um, a Canary Wharf or a High Line or a Millennium Park. These sorts of big city building moves that some of the big global cities make to transform themselves. What's been happening in Hamilton is just a, 
a lot of small, little strategic things that have happened, uh, some of them led by City Hall, many of them led by the artists and the entrepreneurs and the developers and the activists and the neighborhood associations, all those co-creators out in the city. Um, and I think that is, that is going to become uh, the new approach to decision making in, in cities, the new approach to governance in cities, um, because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's probably the only way we're going to be able to tackle some of the complex issues that we're facing. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Yes, Andrea? All right. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I'm going to apologize for the length of my bio. Uh, you're all very patient. <laughs> Clearly, some editing is in order. Um, but I thought I'd start okay. with the framing of really just uh, three things. Why is TD Bank uh, interested in this topic? Uh, how does it align with our overall corporate citizenship and sustainability strategy? And what role uh, can TD and perhaps others in the private sector play uh, in terms of determining and, and trying to develop the, the future cities? Um, so TD is predominantly a North American bank, and North America has uh, the highest rates of urbanization in the world. I think 82% of North Americans uh, live in urban environments. And so for us, that's huge. We have our, our communities, our colleagues, our customers that all tend to be in urban environments. And, and so uh, as a major part of, I think, the Canadian economy and certainly um, on the Eastern Seaboard and the, the US economy, we care about how those folks are, are faring in their cities. You know, can our people get into work? <laughs> I mean, like that's you know a, a real issue that we kind of face because commute times are getting longer, and, and we're having to think about different structures about how people work. Can they afford to uh, to live? Um, do we have um, we have a huge mortgage business? Are people going to be able to afford to even you know buy a, a property? What does that look like? Not to mention a lot of the climate change issues and, and resilience that we're seeing. You know, we have a large insurance business, so every time there's a huge flood, uh, that also hits our bottom line. And, and so we care about it certainly from a corporate uh, citizenship perspective, but we also care about it from a business perspective, right? It really, really matters in terms of how we do our business and our, and our people and what we care about. How it aligns to our broader uh, corporate citizenship strategy, mm -hmm. uh, which is called the Ready Commitment, which is really about trying to open doors for a more inclusive and sustainable tomorrow, is that I think a lot of the themes that we see in this idea of future cities uh, are really resonant with some of the things that when we asked our customers and our employees uh, and, the, and the people that we deal with what they care about and what are the things that make them feel either confident or not about the future, mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that's around cities uh, mattered, right? So we did North American research that showed that one in three uh, North Americans don't feel like they're connected to their communities. Uh, that's a huge issue, and it's going to only be growing because we know that social isolation causes all kinds of other things. We know that a majority were significantly um, worried about the environment, and they were also really worried about their financial security in terms of home ownership and those things. So, so I think we're really well aligned on that front. The role we play is, is I think, is also really important because we want to be very careful to say, coming from a bank, we don't have the answers to these things. But we want to think about how do we use our philanthropy, our business, and our people to try to influence change and make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so in our philanthropy, we do try to support things uh, around grassroots kind of movements that are actually building interest in the topic. We want to actually use it to convene policymakers, governments, and decision makers to come together and be able mm -hmm. to talk. And then we want to also use sort of some of our, our, our business sort of imperatives. So how can we think about um, using our senior leadership to convene others uh, in government to, to be able to talk about these kinds of things and, and, and the issues that we're facing. And we feel like we can really play a role in that as well. So I'll leave it there, and that's sort of, that's why we're here today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. And picking from the insights and statements from our speakers, it's clear that, you know, governing cities imply an assortment of actors, institutions, power brokers, constituencies, stakeholders, et cetera. But what is clear is the ecosystem of cities and governance is shifting. The ethos, the rationalities, the decision-making structures are all changing. And the very fact that we're here in this space today, let's look around where we are. We are not in a neutral random space. We are in the library, which is also part of you know, it's not mundane. It's so central to urban governance because we're talking about public good. And, you know, governing cities, navigating cities interpolate us all to think about from the everyday aspect of our lives that are governed by decision making to the most concrete and compelling and complex ecosystem where decision making 
is taking place. And the key actors that are shaping these decisions on a larger macro you know, scale, et cetera. So, but for now, let's, what does it mean then to navigate um, the various levels of government in the 21st century city? What does it mean for scholars? What does it mean for citizens? What does it mean for community builders? What does it mean for policymakers? What does it mean for bureaucrats? What does it mean for the public sector? What does it mean for civil society to navigate the complex and shifting ecosystem of governing cities in the 21st century? And we have the case of Hamilton. We are here in Toronto. Let's try to think through what are the complexities and challenges and strategies and sites of agency in moving forward and navigating the 21st city, the 21st century city. Yeah. Anyone? Sure, I can yeah. start. Sure. Yeah. Please start, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking about two things. One, um, you know, I think that the idea is, you just pulled out Miriam as well, I mean, this idea of shifting um, um, systems of power and strategy that implies, one thing that highlights for me is um, you know, there's a lot of debate around the role of the formal authority of cities mm -hmm. and if that needs to change or how. And I don't want to fully jump into that <laughs> debate, but, um, but just to put out there that um, regardless of kind of where those debates land, we know that from you know, the, what we've already put forward that uh, formal authority is not going to be a silver bullet of any kind, right? That um, the, the, the challenges we've highlighted are not confined to um, the, the lack or, or um, acquisition of formal authority, right? So I think to me that's part of it is that focusing on uh, simply those formal powers in an intergovernmental system kind of misses the bigger picture, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other thing um, is that as a lot of these new challenges are coming on board, whether it's climate change or growing inequality, I think there's almost a kind of real-time learning going on about where those power structures are and what they look like and who has authority over um, some of the decisions that need to be made, who, whose resources need to be mobilized in order to solve these problems. And so I think there's a little bit of learning as, as we go along. This one of my favorite quotes from uh, someone at TAF actually is this idea that we're, we're building the plane as we're flying the plane, right? And so in terms of navigating those intergovernmental systems, I think we're still learning uh, our way through in some ways, right? You, you get um, uh, stormwater or energy uh, resources that are suddenly these really pressing social and environmental issues. We need to sort through what those governance structures look like. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is from New York City, where um, if anybody has followed it in 2007, they put to get out this really innovative plan NYC. Uh, kind of one of the very first kind of mega sustainability plans um, that cities have been doing. And one of their key recommendations for energy, you know, in addition to emissions reductions and, you know, efficiency rebates and things like this, but one of their key recommendations was restructuring um, the governance arrangements where they felt the, the system was almost so complex between the state and regional power boards and local and federal that, um, you know, key to them moving forward on their goals was a kind of restructuring um, and streamlining of that system. And they weren't particularly successful in, in, in achieving that, but I think uh, some changes were made, um, but it was that kind of in the process of moving toward other goals, the, the ways in which those complexities start to um, uh, play a role become more apparent. Yeah, thank you. I want to pick up on that, on that theme of complexity because I think, it's a, I think it's a good one. I think one of the most important ways that we can help um, uh, we make it easier for that ecosystem to, 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 to navigate uh, the decision-making process is to, is, is to make it unnecessary to navigate the decision-making process in order to affect change in your, in your community. Yeah. And there is a lot of complexity that's, that's been introduced um, in, in our governance structures over many years. Um, and there's a, there's, there's a quote about complexity that I quite like um, by um, a, a guy named Jamie Lerner. He was the former mayor of Curitiba uh, in, in Brazil and a, mm -hmm. a, and a planner. And, and he said, um, what cities need are fewer peddlers of complexity and more philosophers. <laughs> and and I, that, that quote always struck me because I think how you approach uh, 
uh, the planning and governance of your city um, mm -hmm. requires a bit more philosophy, requires a bit more of just um, um, creative thought about where, you, where your city is going. Mm -hmm. um, and then as decision makers and officials, sometimes the best thing you can do and the most important thing you can do is to kind of step back and do nothing. Um, <laughs> step back and kind of see what happens and let things happen. And there's, a, there's, there's unfortunately, I think, quite an aversion to that kind of risk taking um, in, in, in the way we approach governance. Um, but I think uh, that if we're going to be successful cities uh, in the 21st century, that we're gonna have to accept the fact that a lot of the great innovations and ideas are gonna come from all over the place, and if mm -hmm. we don't create space and room for that to happen, then we're gonna miss those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. I think the only thing I would add, too, is that you know um, the complexity can be almost overwhelming, right? And it almost mm -hmm. makes it feel like individual action, whether you're a business or an individual, like is impossible, right? It won't really matter. Um, so we try to sort of approach it um, from a number of different doors. And, and so, you know, certainly, you know, we're involved with working with uh, Maytree and others on the National Urban Project, so bringing mayors and academics and, and experts together to try to convene and really discuss what are some solutions to how we're going to develop, you know, better policy on affordable housing or on climate resiliency. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's really our long-term bet. You know, we don't have any real hope that that's gonna change things immediately. Mm -hmm. But there's other things that we can do that are on the ground <clears throat> that actually just change what people's expectations are about the cities that they're gonna live in. And so mm -hmm. I think about things like park people uh, and how they really change the notion of citizen engagement in parks and who owns the parks and who owns the green space. And you know we have another one in Philadelphia called sort of Tree Philly uh, that looks at actually you know working with residents to plant trees so that some of the heat zones in their communities, which are making kids not be able to play outside because it gets mm -hmm. so hot, um, and taking control of that and being yeah. able to do that. And, and sort of, I think the hope is that with these small incremental wins, we build the citizenship engagement and citizens will then ask their decision makers mm -hmm. to make policy decisions that matter to them. Excellent, and it, it seems that um, taking risk, recognizing complexity, uh, accounting for uncertainty, but allowing for failure sometimes is really important in thinking through, you know, the politics of governance and the sites of power and, you know, the legitimacy of even decision making under complex times and, and, and structures where competing needs and demands for rights and unmet need are always at the forefront of popular demand, contestations, and, 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 and really accountability demand for decision makers and authorities in governance structures within cities and urban centers. But however, what about, what does it mean then to, um, given these potentials and giving also the sites of inclusion and possibilities, uh, what I, it was wonderful to hear the sense of hope or thinking like a philosopher, not just perhaps as a hardcore, uh, perhaps planner or dreaming out loud, thinking big, uh, it really hinges at the possibility, the white, possibilities, the politics of possibility and the politics of hope, uh, de dealing with complexities and uncertainty. But given these parameters and possibilities and insight, how do we leverage then national, provincial, and municipal relationships to advance, I would say, impactful, thoughtful, inclusive, and democratic urban governance? Well, I think, <laughs> <laughs> speaking as someone who, who works at the local level. It's like level, dreaming being, yes, yes. hoping for the future. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and this, this will be a very hopeful statement. Um, <laughs> that I, we need to depoliticize the, 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 the funding models that cities rely upon, mm -hmm. the funding models that, that communities rely upon. Um, there is, the, the challenges that are, that, are, that are being faced in cities go far beyond what local governments, I think, can solve or address. Mm -hmm. um, um, even if they get everything right at the local level, even if they have great buy-in and contribution and engagement from, from, uh, from their communities, um, it, it, it goes far beyond that. And, and when I look at sort of successful cities um, that I've seen around the world, they are cities where senior levels of government have embraced the importance and, and and the power of cities, um, mm -hmm. and have uh, facilitated that, and have um, you know uh, provided the resources and enabled those cities to, to thrive. Um, too often, I feel sometimes that there's almost a, a, a conflict between between local governments and, and, and senior levels of government that somehow by 
um, by, by a national government uh, uh, recognizing and embracing what's happening in cities, they are somehow alienating vast other areas of, of, of the country and, 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 and our rural areas and smaller communities. Um, I think you have to recognize that, the, that at this point in time, mm -hmm. this is not just a Canadian phenomenon, this is a global phenomenon. There's something really significant and important happening in cities mm -hmm. um, and senior levels of government to recognize that. Thank you. Well, I think this is an area actually where the private sector could probably do more to try to push uh, the city's agenda um, because it feels like a lot of the, I'd say bickering between the various levels of government is a little bit like foot stamping saying this is not fair um, <laughs> and, and it doesn't go anywhere, right? Because there's no interest in mm -hmm. changing the status quo because uh, it benefits those who get to make the decision to change it, right? So that we're waiting too specifically into any particular government. Um, but there are a group of uh, actors who have a huge interest in that, who I think have been relatively silent. And I will say we're starting to, you know, have conversations even within TD about, you know, how do we really actually, even in the city of Toronto, think about the issue of affordable housing and, and sort of put some of our calories behind that and say, you know, <laughs> this mm -hmm. is actually a nonpartisan issue. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an issue for everyone. And, and how do we actually then sort of work with governments to be able to do that? And I haven't really seen, mm -hmm. um, I mean, these solutions uh, are going to require academics, not-for-profit sector, governments, and the private sector to come together. Mm -hmm. um, there hasn't been a lot of that so far, um, I would say. It's been, I, the private sector's been largely out of it, but I think there's a, an opportunity to get more involved and use some of their muscle to, get, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. And then, how do we, oh. how, yes, Sarah? Sorry. Would you like to, <laughs> sorry? No problem, but yeah. I was just gonna um, pick up on something yeah. Jason said earlier about this idea that um, change doesn't always ha come from, you know, mm -hmm. kind of big mega projects, but mm -hmm. sometimes it is this accumulation of um, smaller initiatives, you know, big ideas on a smaller scale, um, but that, and, and that is sometimes what facilitates partnerships, that it sometimes only takes a small opportunity um, or that kind of nudge to work together um, for relationships to form. And, and, and so one idea is something I've seen work, right, is when you have, the onus sometimes is on still, I think, the city or, or the, the organization to have that, that um, vision and the plan ready and waiting for when the opportunity does come. So there's, I think, kind of like an advanced preparation that mm -hmm. it requires. But so when there is a window of opportunity or, you know, this kind of idea of venue shopping, you know, when the right partner presents themselves, um, you're kind of ready with, um, with that opportunity and, and can, can go forward. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Synergies seems to be very important, given the high stakes and the number and range of actors involved. And, uh, you know, they need to deliver social good, public good, uh, effectively, and reaching those who are the hardest to reach. And either for those seeking justice or equity-seeking communities, or just who are just left out uh, in governance optics. So, are there examples? How do we tell better stories or good stories that capture you know, some of these complexities and openings and possibilities of, of you know, scaling up uh, local responses to reach collective goals. Are there ways to build better synergies, you know, across sectors, across actors? And do you know of any examples of ways and strategies in which we can, you know, scale up responses to collective goods, the greater good? Mm -hmm. yeah. I can start maybe just with an example that's actually a U.S. example, but I think it's going to be mm -hmm. resonant here as well, which is, um, so TD was the very first corporate sponsor of the High Line in New York mm -hmm. before it was cool, <laughs> right? So I, I will tell you, I think there's a lot of our, our, our executives are like, you know, we're spending what on that? And, you know, how is mm -hmm. that going to help us at all? Um, and, you know, so when we talked to the Highline folks about, you know, sort of what it took to kind of get through the approvals to make that happen and get the funding and do it, like, it was so hard, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a small, like, it's a, that big ambition is really, really hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, and now I think, you know, every week there's something that crosses, you know, our, our desk that sort of says, oh, we're the next Highline and you know, name the city. <laughs> We've got, you know, and, and politicians are lining up behind it and everyone wants to do it. So, you know, I, I think the lesson in that really is, you know, to, to really push through the barriers of those small things because 
once you kind of get it done and you have a good case example, there's then lots of replication that can happen, right? And so sometimes it feels like it's super impossible to get things done, but once done, and I think, you know, the more we have then good stories and good examples of, of sort of benefit, the, the more I think other cities will take it on and think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that, that direct kind yeah. of city to city learning is, 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 is very important and we do have a lot of um, um, uh, good examples out there we can follow. The Highline is actually a very good example of, of when that happened and that became so successful. You've got cities around the world saying, oh, I wish we had an abandoned elevated rail line in our city. <laughs> And it, so it's important not to just sort of say just, you know, direct mimicry of what's happening in other cities. But I think the, the, the spirit of what happened in the High Line, how can we apply that spirit to things that happen in our own communities? And, and, and what I think that spirit was, was a, a, a group of very um, dedicated and committed citizens who, who had a vision, who had a great idea, who, who went through great difficulty to try to get others on board with, with, with what their vision was. Um, but ultimately, you had a you had a local government who said, "Okay, we'll we'll try this thing out." And if you read the story of the High Line, there was all sorts of doomsday scenarios of what could happen: that crime would be rampant, that property mm -hmm. values would collapse because you'd get vagrancy on this this new feature. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be amazing successful. In fact, the downside is actually on the complete flip successful. side of that: <laughs> is that it's so amazingly successful that that that, that property values in that area have, have gone. It's the Everest um, of New York City. Yes. Uh, so I think that the what, what I take away from a high line is not, hey, I'm going to try to build a high line in Hamilton, um, but what great ideas are out there in our city? What great ideas are out there in our city that just by giving them a chance, um, they could actually transform your city? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Sarah? Um, yeah, my, my favorite example of this, um, and I, I imagine there might be people in the audience that are even more um, familiar with it than me, so I hope I do it justice, as um, the TowerWise program in Toronto. Uh, so this was a collaboration between TAF, the Atmospheric Fund, and the Toronto Community Housing um, to introduce deep energy and water retrofits in social housing buildings as a way of both helping the city meet its climate change goals on the one hand, but improving um, comfort and um, housing security and lowering uh, the bills of people um, living in Toronto community housing units. And these are buildings often in, in, in significant need of, of repair and, um, and upgrade. And you know, these are buildings in dire need of such retrofit. So um, there's a lot of innovation in this program. Some of it was in the financing model itself, how to finance and, and get payback from these kind of retrofits, the actual inter-organizational um, work and, and partnership on the project. There's a lot of um, monitoring, um, you know, very close monitoring of the benefits. And it started in one co-op building, super successful, went to 10 TCHC buildings, super successful. There's now a whole ecosystem of partners helping to keep um, expanding the program. And here we're talking just about scaling up to the city scale, you know, uh, uh, before even talking about other cities, you know, trying to get this to scale up uh, within Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we were trying to understand, you know, my, my understanding anyway is that um, there's a bit of a ceiling in, in the sense that the province has a major role to play in um, uh, f providing funding for community housing, right? And this, there's suddenly these um, institutional um, mismatches and whether these same tools can be used and there's rules about that they can't. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we start getting up against, I don't know that it's always even um, a lack of will, but significant complexities that that are um, that are part of this. So, I think there's other ways of, of they're trying to scale it up now. But um, again, it is an example of using that initial success to then mm -hmm. um, build out and having that ability to kind of push through the initial hurdles, which are typically mundane and terrible, and accounting offices and <laughs> <laughs> um, nobody has fun with this, but can really really pay off. Yeah. Wonderful, and I'm sure as a scholar and also as a bureaucrat and the public sector actor, we find ways 
of publicizing, disseminating these um, local, local successes. Small in scale, but impactful, but how do we magnify mm -hmm. local responses to the point where they become visible and sites where we can refer to them, go identify them, document them, scale them up, and compare them, not in the local settings, but mm -hmm. also you know, in comparative settings as well. Mm -hmm. So the, mm -hmm. the, the challenge is actually dissemination and making sure you know, we grant validity to local responses. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. you're dealing with expert knowledge and sometimes sites of power, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. local responses, effective as they may be, may not really be in the public purview because of the niche or because the fact of the fact that they're not highly publicized. Have any final comments on that? And then we'll shift to mm -hmm. conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no? Very good. So now we'll open the floor to questions, contributions, suggestions, comments. Yes. We have 10 to 10 minutes conversation. Yes, please. Yeah. Is anyone? She's running yeah, away. The mic is coming, yeah. And we'll take a set of questions, two at a time, to allow you time to respond. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, my question's for Andrea Barrick. And um, I, I don't know if you saw the uh, documentary film called Push at Hot Docs. Uh, Lilani um, Farah was also on the uh, front cover of Now magazine talking about um, housing uh, being used as investment rather than as living space and the enormous uh, amount of wealth that is stored in the pattern that has left cities across the world with these empty uh, investment units worth uh, more than the entire GDP of all the countries of the world in trillions. And so I ran over to my financial advisor uh, who was peddling an ethical package uh, that uh, I was insisting on no fossil fuels in mine. And hidden, I will uh, let the bank rename, remain nameless, but hidden in this package was Blackstone, which is one of the biggest hedge fund managers of housing investment. And so I said, look, this is not an ethical package. Uh, so my question to you is, are the banks, uh, well, of course, divestment is the big strategy that I want to talk about, like oh, when we have major pension funds having these hidden investments and it, oh, people are totally oblivious to the ethical uh, deviation that they're participating in. Um, would the banks be willing for, to some kind of regulation that says you you have to avoid dirty money kind of projects. Uh, you have to um, keep it all ethical uh, or have some kind of um, practice standard for financing uh, cities that is going to mean you know much better use of space and uh, much more equity in uh, living quarters. Thank you. We'll take another question. Two more questions, and then. Up well, to that's a pretty big question. I'd like to hear. A yes, she will. Answer. She will answer your question. I'll, I'll get to Yes, it. absolutely. Worry. Yeah. Yeah. Right behind you. Hi, uh, my name is Michelle Berkowitz. I'm with the City of Mississauga and the University of Toronto, and I say that by way of, I'm here on behalf of two institutions. I think a lot of us are here on behalf of institutions, so that you're here as representatives of the kinds of institutions. People trust and engage with institutions or individuals they feel know and care about them. And I think when we look at the 21st century and this idea of cities scaling up, the technology available to us allows us to be a bigger group of people that are paid attention to at a much smaller scale. So although we may live in bigger groups, we 
you know, the internet is that big city of a small town uh, mentality. For example, if Google knows where you live and work and your favorite restaurants, and Starbucks knows what you like in your coffee, and Netflix knows your favorite kind of movies, these are intimate personal details that formerly only people you knew and trusted and cared about would know about you. And now these very large institutions, uh, you know, commercial service providers, know about us. Uh, so those of us, those of us who have access to those digital tools, uh, are known by these um, commercial institutions. So when we look at the landscape of public trust and how the landscape of public trust is changing, I think for a lot of people it's very hard not to sort of trust or at least relate with these institutions that they feel know and care uh, because they have this very intimate personal relationship with. So I'm wondering about the institutions you work on behalf of or the institutions you work with. Uh, you know, as the 21st century offers more and more tools to relate to small individuals at very large scales, how do those tools affect the nature of the work that you're doing or the way that you do the work that you do, whether academically or privately or um, for government? Okay. Anyone? Well, I think the... Questions. First question is probably just for yeah. me, <laughs> so I can start with that. Uh, so, so big topic and big question. I, I think what I will say is that uh, using environmental, social, and governance screens for both how people invest their money and, and how, how they sort of choose to do it is increasing so rapidly. So I've been with the bank for two years, and if you'd asked me when I started, would, as part of my role, I'd be meeting with investors who are concerned about these kinds of issues and what the bank was doing, I would have said, no, probably not. Why, why do they care about that kind of stuff? But they are increasing. Um, so we get a number of questions. If you look at all the shareholder proposals we get or other mm -hmm. things, they are on environmental, social, and governance issues. And we have an asset management company that also then invests on behalf of others. So there's a number of different um, ways that this can happen. And I do think there's increasing interest in what those screens are and giving people the choice to put their money um, in alignment with what their beliefs are. And that's a really, really positive thing. And I, and I think that's only going to continue to increase. And so you're asking absolutely the right questions uh, when you look at where to put your money. I will say, though, the um, larger institutional investors, like pensions, actually are the most sophisticated and the most stringent when it comes to those things. Because they have the pensions of all of those you know, municipal workers and teachers mm -hmm. and others that they have to do for a really, really long time frame. And so they're actually the toughest in asking those questions as opposed to others. So, so it was a good question. If, if I could pick up on the second question. Absolutely. Right? I think this is, yeah. the issue of trust in institutions is a, is a, is a significant one. And, and, and speaking as someone who works in local government, um, you know, governments tend not to score too well on all of those various trust uh, surveys and trust mm -hmm. indicators that are out there. Um, I, I think what's, in, what's important to, 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 to build up that trust in the community is, is, is a couple of things. A lot of it is just about relationship building. I think as, as, um, as bureaucrats, there's a bit of a hesitation sometimes in just kind of being out there in the community, um, not just because you have a policy to sell them, um, not just because you're checking off some boxes, boxes around a, um, a report you want to bring forward and you have to say you did the obligatory public meeting, um, but having... Uh, just having an ongoing dialogue and a relationship with, with people in the community, I think, is, I think is very important. Um, and, uh, it, it, and, and it is something that is, if, if we're going to embrace this idea, we'll go back to what I talked about earlier around, around co-created cities, um, mm -hmm. it, that can be kind of thrown out there as just kind of a, a nice buzzword. If you really think about what it means, it means everybody's supposed to be on an equal footing. Um, it means you're supposed to be in this together and working through these issues together. So um, I know in, 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 my, in my department, we, we, we try as best we can to, um, to get out and meet with neighborhood associations, meet with business owners. Um, we, we, have, we have a program in my, in my department where every six weeks or so, I take a whole group of my staff and we go and we just sit and we have lunch with the person who's opened a restaurant in the city because a lot of what we do is we try to help facilitate these kinds of business investments. Um, and just kind of hear the story of what was it like setting up a business in our city? What what would what did we do well? What could we do differently? Um, let us see uh, let us see our processes from your side of the counter. Um, these kinds of things I think are important uh, to building up trust. Um, I do use social media fairly often. I think it's it's a great tool, but it's a very limited tool. Um, it's a very polarizing tool. Um, I, I, I think unfortunately you don't see a lot of um, cross constructive cross communication between camps and between interests. Um, in some ways, I think that institutions and governments can, can try to fill some of that space between the extremes. 
Um, so I think that helps, but, I, but I've always been of view there, there, is, there is no replacement for just kind of, um, you know, uh, being out in the world, being out in that city that you're trying to shape and change. Yeah, this is a good question. I mean, um, if I'm thinking about it from the perspective of the University of Toronto as, you know, my, my institution here, I've been at the university for just four, four years, so I don't have a great sense for um, a longer term uh, relationship or dynamic, let's say, with the city, but um, in the time I have been at the university, I've really, I've actually really been struck by um, a bit of pivoting that I've seen toward that, and honestly, I would hold this, the School of Cities up as an example of this. You know, um, I was part of the conversations leading up to its creation, and there was a deep commitment to outreach and engagement as being really key to the school's mission, um, which, you know, honestly wouldn't have had to be there, right? Like nobody was kind of forcing that administratively or something, but that I think there is an ethos um, building at the university that's always been there, but let's say is gaining resources or um, maybe perhaps more front and center. Like I said, I've got a four-year perspective, but um, I've seen the same. I teach at the Mississauga campus as well, and I've seen actually the same thing there, this kind of um, increasing awareness of the university's place in the community. Um, you know, universities are a bit like large ships, you know, in terms of steering in a new direction. Um, but uh, I think that I've, anyway, been, my honest perception is that I've been um, quite impressed, actually, by that, that pivot that, that's happening and find it encouraging. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I, <laughs> hi, I'm Faria. I work with the municipality. Um, I just had two super. I'll keep my questions super brief. The first was um, something you picked. Uh, something Jason talked about what, about the rural and urban divide. And I was wondering whether you think, in order to um, broach that, do we need a change in our voting systems? Um, you know, at the provincial and national level. And has there been some thought, maybe? Uh, Sarah, on the, you know, what is the right political system for that um, mixed member proportional direct democracy. Um, second really brief question was about something Andrea uh, mentioned in terms of working with the mayors and, you know, the heads of divisions at different cities. Um, I think one thing that tends to get lost is that a lot of the work ends up coming down to the staff and in terms of the implementation. And I think you know, from what was initially said to what actually comes down to the staff, there can be a lot of watering down or a lot of changes. And how do you better engage municipal staff in those conversations who are actually implementing the work day to day? Thank you. And we have one hand here. One last question. Here, here. Okay, why don't you go ahead? Go ahead. question. Did you want me to ask a question too? Or? Thank you. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm Chris Fraser. Great presentation. Um, I guess getting back to Jason's concept of co-creation, to really inspire the city to bring their ideas forward, you kind of need either a methodology, either their encouragement or a place to, to do that. So do you think it's possible, Marianne, to see the School of Cities really create a Wikipedia type process that basically would encourage people to bring their own ideas forward, the bankable ideas. The Highline is well documented. Um, I've got the, uh, one of the key people that put the Bentway together here in the city. So we, there are a lot of ideas, but I think it's the bankable ones as to how it was done, finding the opportunity and the resources and putting it forward. And I guess it really needs a format and access so that you know, you don't necessarily always have to do the Bentway. You can do a community garden. So, you know, is it, is it, how do you build that framework to, to get that innovation, those ideas you're talking about, into motion? Thank you. Thank you. 
One final question. Um, so, my, for me, I'm a huge believer in grassroots, grassroots work and um, all the local work that we're talking about between institutions, co creating this cohesion and collaboration um, to fuel the growth of our cities. But for me, my question is, in this era where we find ourselves facing this reality where facts and research findings don't necessarily sway um, our representatives, um, up at the pro provincial level and looking at our relationship bet between the province and the city, um, how do we then fight for a more resilient city when we have um, decision makers using the law to block <laughs> what um, we would like to see done? Um, a lot of what they are doing, they have the purview to do and as long as we don't address that issue. I, in some sense, I don't want to sound pessimistic, it kind of almost makes it seem as the work we're trying to do collaboratively might almost feel like it's being done in vain um, when we're not addressing that core issue. So what tools or tips um, do we come away with from this conference to address that issue? Thank you. We'll turn to the, our panelists mm -hmm. for answers, yeah. Sure, I can start, and um, so I, I can. I'll, I'll say something about this question here. I think um, um, one recommendation, I guess, is that I think there's a need. I think you're absolutely right. There's definitely there's no evidence that the problems or you know the decision making goes one way or the other. Um, that that's driven largely by any kind of lack of information, right? And so to me, I think the challenge really is changing the political calculus behind of, of, of what it means to not address these issues, right? I think there's an assumption, this happens in climate change all the time, so this, this is where I'm coming from, right? That you can pull people and you say, do you think climate change is a problem? Everyone says yes, or an increasingly large proportion of the population says, yes, I think climate change is a problem, but you ask them, you know, where does it lie on your priorities? And it, it's, 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 it's down, so it's not that I don't think it's a problem, but it's, you know, it's my fifth or sixth priority. And so until decision makers think that there's electoral consequences for not addressing this issue, there's, those are the consequences they care about, right? They don't maybe necessarily care as much about falling on the, 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 the wrong side of science or something, right? Um, and so I think that's what, that's what I've seen, at least in, in terms of the current thinking around um, you know, climate policy, is that it's that political calculus that needs to shift. Um, and I'll also just say something in terms of you know, setting up these governance structures, or you know, setting up city governments that work for us and, and what this looks like. Um, w one thing I would say about that is that um, there's two ways to think about it. There's the outcome and the process of setting these up, right? And I think that there's, there can be a lot, I don't think there's any uh, magical arrangement of a city council or a city government that is going to automatically produce one type of policy or another. I think there's a lot of different ways to set up city governments in ways that work. There's examples of highly, almost radically decentralized city governments that are totally dysfunctional, and there's examples of highly centralized city governments that are doing a lot of great things, right? So I think that in terms of identifying the perfect arrangement, it's tough, and there's a lot of different ways going forward that would, depending on what works for a city, but for me, I think um, what's maybe more important is the process by which you know, we get to those arrangements or, or the, the mechanisms we have in place for, for evaluating them um, is almost more important than what they um, end up looking like at the end of the day. So. Jason, thank you. And, and, and I'm going to pick up on the, on, on the first two questions, and maybe this is also sort of my message that you asked for at the end of the day, and I, and I won't take credit for it because I'm stealing it. Um, uh, there's, there's a writer, and his, his name is Peter Kageyama. He wrote a book, For the Love of Cities, and he, and he had a line in there that said, um, each of us makes or breaks the city in small ways every day. Uh, and I think that's really important when thinking about to the first question about sort of the, you know, the role of sort of frontline city staff and, and, and how are they part of this change and transformation that's happening in, in, in cities or the co-creators out in the community. Mm -hmm. um, 
it is, it is something that each of us, whether we're consciously doing it or not, each of us has an impact on, on what happens in our cities. And usually it's not the big move. Usually it's not that sort of big, grand project that's going to capture the headlines. It's in the minutia of the small things that happen each and every day. Um, I know in, in, in my department, it's, it's, you know, it, it's a fairly large group. I have, I have um, 800 staff in my department, and it's, it's across many disciplines. It's, it's planning, it's parking, it's bylaw enforcement, and uh, the, the arts and culture group. It's a, it, it's a very diverse uh, group of people, but I can tell you that what, um, to a person, what sort of the common thread that each of those, those groups share is, is these are people who are really proud of their city, mm -hmm. and they really want to see their city change. Uh, I got to tell you, there's, there is something about Hamilton and, and, and the spirit that exists in that city of people who want to see their city move forward. Um, and for each person, that means something differently. It means, it means something different for a, from a building inspector to a parking enforcement officer to a, to a city planner. Um, but I think if you have that clear vision of, um, of where you want to go as a city, and then you're able to sort of step back and, and, and again, create that space for for individuals to contribute in a positive way, whether it's an individual city staff person or whether it's somebody out in the community. Um, I, I, I think that's, you know, to get back to the original kind of, the kind of concept of, of, of this discussion around um, how do you navigate the 21st century city, um, I think that's what's at the essence of it, is that it is something that is going to be done collectively. It, it, it is no longer going to be, you know, to, to my earlier comment about, you know, authority was yesterday. This is no longer going to be um, traditional decision makers uh, making, making the decisions. Thank you. Um, I have a lot of sympathy about, you know, frontline staff versus what the top of the house says. I, I read the media clips every day so I can make sure that I <laughs> wear what our senior leaders are saying mm -hmm. on particular issues. Um, but I think where I'd leave it is that, you know, no one would ever come up with this particular governance and financing system that we have for cities if we wanted to sort of really look ahead about what we need to do. I mean, that we're here because of a collection of decisions that came so far before us, and, and so that's sort of making it really, really difficult. And mm -hmm. I always think, you know, a good structure and system should make it easy to do the right thing and hard to do the wrong thing. And when it comes to cities, we're in the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. It's actually really easy to do the wrong thing and really hard to do the right thing, but that doesn't mean it's not important and worth the time and effort, and so we're at this place, unfortunately, where I think that just require, you know, my message is like, keep driving, at, you know, even though it's really, really hard to try to get those right things done in the hopes that long, uh, over the longer term we can get the system reset a bit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please join me to thank Sarah, Jason, Andrea for, for such an insightful, informative, and generative conversation. You've been very generous with your time, your knowledge, and your insight, so thank you. And to the public, thank you for being here. Thank you for your insight, your contributions, your questions. We appreciate your contributions and having you here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lowe. Uh, thank you, panelists. Um, I think that was a phenomenal panel that left us, uh, that grappled with difficult issues uh, and left us with a point of positivity and optimism and hope. And I think uh, with cities, with all of the challenges that we face, uh, it's important that we get into the details on everything that's wrong with cities. I think panels like this remind us that, that there's a lot going right and well, and also that there are processes in place and people that care deeply who are working uh, in all sorts of institutions that are driving for the positive change that's going to lead to uh, cities that are uh, inclusive, fair, and just. So with that, that brings us to the conclusion of the morning uh, portion of our uh, event today. Uh, we're now going to have lunch. Um, lunch is served at the back of the room. Uh, the quiet room is still in place for anyone who needs it. Um, and we will reconvene at 12.45 uh, for a uh, fireside-style uh, chat with uh, Richard Florida uh, and Bill Peduto, the mayor of uh, Pittsburgh, uh, talking about governing for inclusive cities. So with that, uh, uh, let's have lunch, um, and we will reconvene uh, in about 45 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um.
Before we get started, I wanted to just give a shout out and a big thank you to uh, the musicians uh, from the U of T Music School. <laughs> Lovely, fantastic, thank you so much. Um, now it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Councillor Anna Bailau. Uh, she is uh, the Deputy Mayor uh, as well for the City of Toronto, and she will uh, uh, come up to uh, introduce uh, today's panelists. Thank you. Couldn't have asked for a better lunch break from Planning and Housing Committee than uh, coming to the School of Cities. And thank you uh, for organizing this uh, great symposium. And, and thank you for all the work that you do um, on the discussion of urban issues and, and uh, policy uh, and ideas that you put forward. So thank you for all your work. We are indeed fortunate today to have both Mayor Bill uh, Peduto and Professor Richard Florida here for this fireside chat at the Governing Cities in the 21st Century Symposium. They are both outstanding leaders on urban issues. Mayor Peduto's leadership of the city of Pittsburgh is clearly appreciated by his residents. In 2013, Mayor Peduto was elected with 84% of the vote. And in 2017, he secured 96% of the votes casted. Wow, that is quite something. I did get 84% last election, Mayor. I will aim for the 96 my following election. <laughs> mayor Peduto's tenure as mayor has focused on making Pittsburgh a leading 21st century city. He has worked to address the major challenges facing contemporary municipalities across the world. Issues ranging from affordable housing to economic development to technology and transportation. His fellow Fireside Chat panelist, Professor Richard Florida, is of course a leader in urban studies known around the world for his work in this field study. In, uh, we here in Toronto are fortunate that he serves as uh, professor and head of the Martin Prosperity Institute at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. Professor Florida has written and spoken extensively with regard to his research on the creative class and the impact they have had in urban regeneration. His theories on, on urban issues and his many books are art, and articles, of course, have provided scholars and students, and must I say politicians, or at least I hope so, with countless subjects for considerations and debate. You may know that uh, the term fireside chat began in, with American President Franklin Roosevelt, who delivered the first so-called fire, fireside chat in 1933. 30 more would follow between then and 1944. President Roosevelt's fireside chats helped to make important issues more personal, more personal for people, they made people feel a part of the decision making, and they also made them feel directly involved with the issues being addressed. So we are indeed fortunate that this format of informal discourse between two eminent urban leaders is being made available for us today. This is especially so when dealing with urban issues as they are the most directly impactful on the lives of city dwellers. Of course, I'm just a little bit biased on this uh, thought. Across the world, the importance of cities with respect to social and economic development is increasing. It is now estimated that the top 600 cities across the world are home to 20% of the world's population, but are responsible for about 60% of the gross domestic product. Here in Canada, 80% of Canadians live in urban centers, and our six largest cities are home to 50% of our population which are in turn responsible for 50% of our gross domestic product. The role of cities is continually evolving, evolving. Increasingly, cities relate to federal, provincial, state, and other cities as equal partners, or at least we fight hard for that. It is a debate that is particularly current in our province, where the role of cities is very much a topic of current concern and interest. Our guests today will touch on the involving role of cities as they relate to partnerships with non-governmental institutions such as post-secondary institutions. 
They are to discuss the role of tech and potential impacts on inequality, as well as intergovernmental partnerships and innovative policy directions. All subjects of great relevance to our City of Toronto, where, for example, we are seeking to address inequality through our poverty reduction strategy. And as the city's housing advocate, I have helped shape our city's housing policies as we move to towards lasting solutions to housing affordability. Actually, as we now speak, as I said, we're on break, but at Planning and Housing, we are currently discussing inclusionary zoning. After 14 requests to the provincial government and a big hope that Bill 108 is not going to change anything and actually allow us to proceed with the implementation of inclusionary zoning in this city, which is much, much needed. The enormous growth in tech jobs in our city has also created unique partnerships between tech companies, educational institutions, and our city government. Today's fireside chat is focused on issues of great relevance to our city and along you. I look forward to the insights that will be provided by our panelists. I would like to thank Mayor Peduto and Professor Florida for being here, and like you, I look forward to engaging in this fireside chat. Please welcome Mayor Peduto and Professor Florida. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, thank you to my colleagues in the School of Cities, Maddie Samiatiki, Mark Fox, who runs research, Miriam Lowe, who runs our academic programs. Special thanks to my great friend, Shauna Braille, uh, who runs engagement for the school and who stewarded the committee and the process to put on this event and many, many, I think Maddie mentioned, we've done 50 plus events. Uh, so thank you, Shauna, for getting us all together here. Thank you, Bill, for making the trek from Pittsburgh. Um, I just want to say that there is a lot of common fiber uh, between Pittsburgh and Toronto and between the University of Toronto and Carnegie Mellon. Um, I share those cities, so I'm one thread. Mark Fox also shares the same thread. And I know many of you probably know this, but we are seeing Pittsburgh is really the home of artificial intelligence in the world. We are now seen as one of the most important places in Toronto in artificial intelligence in the world. And the person who made that reputation, Jeff Hinton, was a professor at Carnegie Mellon well before my time. He left in 1980, I was telling the mayor, uh, for two reasons. I don't know Jeffrey, but for two reasons as I understand it. One, he didn't like the Department of Defense funding his research. And two, he had no particular taste for Ronald Reagan. Uh, and he came here to be in a more open environment environment, and he then built uh, Toronto and Canada's AI system. And we're close. Physically, we're close. Our building stock looks similar. Toronto's a lot larger now, uh, but the cities do, do have a great physical uh, connection. Um, I think we've known each other for now 30 years, and the mayor, oh. yeah, <laughs> the mayor said to me this morning, I thought he, he, had, he had been a distinguished counselor. I thought we met when he was a counselor. He he corrected me and he said, no, we met when he was the chief of staff to another counselor. Uh, and then we would talk, and I mean, this is very relevant. And maybe I want to start with this, throwing aside my notes. Pittsburgh for a long time was not known for its great leadership. Some might say the same about Toronto in its current incarnation at some levels. Um, and you and I would talk about how to overcome that. Um, how Pittsburgh could elect a new generation, a new kind of mayor who was an urbanist. I remember us bemoaning this and talking about this. How, how do you think that happened? You know, Pittsburgh did have some mayors who were not, not only as urban focused, but had all sorts of issues. How do you think, not just you, but what do you think were the set of forces that enabled uh, you as a person, but this new urbanistic quality of leadership to come to the fore in Pittsburgh? Well, I think it's important to understand that, you know, I tried to run in 2005, I finished second. Yep. 2007, when uh, Mayor O'Connor passed away, I had to drop out of the race because my poll numbers were so bad that uh, the only thing that I would be able to accomplish according to my pollster was not committing political suicide. Um, and then by two 2013, I lost the endorsement of the firefighters. I lost the endorsement of the police. I lost the endorsement of the building trades. I lost the endorsement of the downtown corporate community. 
I didn't have the endorsement of either newspaper. All the traditional powers that built mayors in the past were all with my opponent, who outspent me during the last few weeks of the campaign two to one. And we won uh, because we had the support of the people. And we had the support of the neighborhood groups. We had the support of the unions that worked in social services and the service industry. We had support of the, um, uh, the faith community. Um, and we put together a grassroots campaign. That has, you've seen that happen in council races, you've seen that happen in state representative races. At the smaller scale throughout Allegheny County, there is a new electorate. How that was created? Part of it is my generation doesn't live in Pittsburgh. We were forced out in the 80s and the 90s. The older population is passing away and it's being taken over by a younger generation, Pittsburgh leads in the top five cities in the United States in the attraction of millennials. And they're being brought there by the universities. And unlike my generation, they're staying because now there are jobs. The unemployment rate in Pittsburgh today is at its lowest since the 1970s, since before the steel industry crashed. And what you're seeing are those young people voting. How, you, you know, you and I were talking um, Bill and I were talking about the different periods of Pittsburgh history because we both care deeply about the city and we both know the history pretty well. Um, Pittsburgh obviously had a very devastating economic body blow going back to the 70s and 80s. And I want you to talk about that because you lived through it. You're a native Pittsburgher. And um, what that dealt the city to lose hundreds of thousands of jobs. But you were saying something very interesting to me this morning. You were saying the 1990s are kind of a lost period yeah. in the city's history. When, when so much of the seed, the, I don't know what it was, planting the seeds, yep. seed work, spade work, was being done to grow very small scale initiatives, Bill was mentioning them, uh, that later blossomed into many of the things that are credited, some at universities, some at the arts and culture, some in, in, in city building. Why don't you take us through, and, and feel free to take as long as you want, that, that, how that historical trauma hit, and then the process of rebuilding to get to today, which is probably the real renaissance. I'll take you back a little bit further and then... So, 1940s, Pittsburgh is producing more steel during World War II than Germany and Japan combined. We were in the industrial powerhouse of the second industrial revolution. And we also produced air that was dangerous to breathe, mm -hmm. water that was poisonous to drink, in the greatest disparity between the haves, the people that owned and managed the mills, the mines, and the factories, and those like my grandfather's that worked in them. Uh, so we put together a public-private partnership called the Allegheny Conference and Community Development. We created the first Clean Air Act in American history, 20 years before Congress ever brought it up. We rolled up our sleeves and we went to work to clean our water, and to make sure that our city didn't flood every spring. And we organized in the mills and the mines and the factories and created the labor movement in the United States that allowed us not only to build America, but we built the middle class. So we learned through our mistakes what it was we needed to do. And in that process changed from the industrial giant to the third largest corporate headquarters in the United States, New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh the most Fortune 500 companies headquartered in the United States. Then came 1979. Yep. Steelers won their fourth <laughs> Super Bowl in six years. Pir yeah, Steelers. Pirates won their second World Series in the 70s. Willie Stargell, we are family. And Pittsburgh died. We died. The entire economic heart was ripped out of us. We lost more people in the 80s the New Orleans lost after wow. Hurricane Katrina. We saw unemployment greater than during the Great Depression. And that's even after everybody left. There was no economy. And all of those companies that located started to leave. And there was no plan for us. There was no financial bailout or anything else. We had to roll up our sleeves and go to work. And that really was what led us into those 90s. Because there was no plan, there were creative yeah, people yeah, yeah. who were finding their own way and being able to do their own thing 
and they were. They were sprinkling seeds. But it goes back, I mean, 1979, when the, the, the industry finally crashed, was the same year that Carnegie Mellon created the first program in robotics. Yep. It was in the 1980s where they created the first PhD in robotics. And it's people from around the world started to come into Pittsburgh. It's, it's back in those 1970s when uh, Tom Dietra took a little hospital on the University of Pittsburgh's campus and started to build out a medical empire that today employs nearly 80,000 people, the largest employer in the state of Pennsylvania, in whose letters UPMC are on top of the U.S. Steel Building. And it was those planting of those big seeds, but cultural. The investment in the arts and culture during the 80s and the 90s yeah. by the philanthropic community, the Warhol Museum, the Carnegie Science Center, the Children's Museum, the Cultural District. We didn't sell it off. We invested <laughs> and doubled down. We built riverfront trails, knowing maybe someday this city will come back and it will be even better. And the smaller groups. You know, we met through a group called Ground Zero that was created because of the plan of the mayor at the time was to demolish the downtown core and put an Anywhere USA shopping mall yep. into it. And we fought like hell to keep those abandoned old buildings there. And today, they're filled with stores. That's re really interesting. This mayor, Tom Murphy, who's become a very close friend, we were not friends. Um, and he says to this day, he introduced me at the Urban Land Institute, he said, when, when you all came to the office with these ideas, we thought you were from the moon, including yeah. the university partnership. But over time, we realized you were right. So that's the kind of place Pittsburgh is. A mayor who was hunkered down into downtown demolition and redevelopment saw afterwards and has become an advocate. You mentioned two things that I think an audience from here could benefit from because in, we are very different, although we're very similar. Uh, there are things we're very different on. You mentioned the role of philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, I think you said it has the second largest philanthropic sector after Seattle with Gates and Allen and Bezos and all of these riches. The role of philanthropy, which we don't have. I mean, we have benefaction here to some degree, but we don't, Canada doesn't have an estate tax like the US, so people can hand the money down. The second thing you mentioned, I want you to capture both, is the role of the business community. Yeah. He mentioned the Allegheny Conference on Community Development. In Pittsburgh history, for good and bad, I'm not saying this is all in unalloyed good, yeah. the leaders, the captains of industry, when the city was down in the dumps, came together and said, we have to fix the flooding problem, we have to fix the environmental problem, we have to make our city more livable, we have to invest later in universities. The business community was a big player, which, which also doesn't happen here. Our business community is honestly not involved. So the role of philanthropy in business partnered with government, in addition to government, candidly good and bad. How has that played a role in Pittsburgh's transformation? Well, it's, uh, I don't know who said it first, but uh, partnership is the new leadership, yeah. is the model for cities all throughout the world. Um, you can't do it alone. You can't rely on your federal government or your provincial government to do it for you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you, you have to find the way to do it yourselves. And the only way that you can do it yourself is by partnering, partnering with your corporate community, partnering with your philanthropic community, partnering with um, the, the institutions, large universities, hospitals, being able to become partners and then putting together a common mission in seeing it done. Um, so Pittsburgh was Seattle uh, 150 yeah, yeah. years ago. We were the home of Westinghouse and Heinz and Frick, m the yep. Mellons and Carnegie and all of these extraordinarily wealthy white guys back in that time. And I, mm -hmm. I, I sometimes get upset that Frick and Carnegie hated each other so much mm -hmm. because I have no doubt that if they did get along, the school would have been known as Carnegie Frickin' Mellon. <laughs> pretty good. Um, but anyway, so their, their wealth never left. They, they left the legacy to the city of Pittsburgh. And during those times in the 80s when, I mean, we were at the worst economic point in American history, yep. they held our head above the water. And they helped us to get to the other side and to be able to then rebuild. Um, and today we look at it in slightly a different model we try to find where there is core mission of what we want to be able to accomplish, what the philanthropic community wants to be able to accomplish, and we work together in order to be able to do that. 
I think that if you look at the difference between Mayor David Lawrence in the 1950s in yeah. an administration today, his partners were the heads of industry, yeah. but the heads of industry were Pittsburghers. The Mellons were running Mellon. The Hunts were running Alcoa. Um, you still had the family interests that didn't answer to a bunch of trustees or stockholders, but had the answer about why your mill is putting out that dirty air. Um, so we, we sort of lost that ability, uh, but fortunately in Pittsburgh, the corporate community today understands that they have a vital role and a responsibility. Before we get back to Pittsburgh, I want to flip roles on you just for a second, because I think your advice could be very helpful. And I don't want you to have advice for our mayor, Mayor Tory, very capable guy. Come, he actually comes from one of these families. He comes from one of the families. His dad helped build many of the great, as a lawyer, many of the great companies of, 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 Pitts, of Toronto. What would you say to our business community? Uh, we have some of the biggest banks in the world headquartered in Toronto. Toronto is kind of, if you took New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco and put them together, we have the biggest tech companies. We have the biggest, the companies building New York, Brookfield and Oxford are Toronto companies, real estate companies. But for some reason, they're not as involved. Now, who knows? I, I could give reasons for the political environment of Canada, the difference. Well, if you had to come and give advice to the business community of Toronto, the banks, the real estate community, the tech companies, to be involved more in the city, what might you say to them? And, and using yeah, no, I'd say the same thing I'd say to the Pittsburgh companies, and which I have said. The... Um, <clears throat> idea of a single bottom line of profit uh, was created in the 19th century, and it won't be a part of 21st century, at least not for city's uh, economic theory. Uh, in Pittsburgh, we call it P4, people, planet, place, and performance. And that's how we measure what we are going to fund with government money. Those should be the same standards that we look at as an economic standard. Instead of seeing things like air pollution as externalities, they actually need to be put into the equation of what is true economic growth, not limited economic growth. And what I would say to the Toronto CEOs is look at us. We were the yep. example. Yep. We made a ton of money. We produced <laughs> billionaires, and we made air that killed people, water that killed people in disparity between the haves and the have-nots. If you put those into the equation now, you don't have to spend time later trying to fix what went wrong. But if you don't, and you're not proactive in putting that and addressing it as part of your business model, you will have to fix it. So planning becomes more than just an Adam Smith model of economics. It becomes a model of understanding where people are. Uh, Pittsburgh, during the, the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, referred to its comeback as the Renaissance. The Renaissance, historically, was followed by the humanist movement. Yep. And it was the understanding of not arts and science, but the investment in people. And to any city that really wants to leapfrog other cities, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are a great way in order to see if you're really succeeding or if you're just making money. So um, the other partner in Pittsburgh's renewal have been the universities. Um, University of Pittsburgh, which you mentioned with its great medical center and many of the things it does. Carnegie Mellon, where I taught for nearly 20 years, artificial intelligence. You mentioned robotics, computer science. Um, we have a university here that's bigger than both of them combined, the University of Toronto. We have other great universities, Ryerson, OCAD, Warwick York. What were some of the key things that you did? When, when, remember, when Bill and I met, the universities in the city didn't get along, didn't really talk to one another. And if you know Pittsburgh, there's a downtown, which was the corporate center, and the universities are what, four or five miles? Not even. Not even, three miles. And they're separated, but it was, we used to say, maybe that's the new downtown. We'd be sitting around, maybe that's a second downtown. Maybe we could create an innovation corridor. But in the city hall, and, and many people said, oh, that's nonsense, that's what that mayor was saying. It's crazy. R&D, research and development, universities, they don't play any role in economic development. How did that happen? And it's what we're doing, what Shauna's doing, what our president, Mary Gertler, is doing, and others here. 
How did that happen so that now Carnegie Mellon, University of Pittsburgh, when you talk about Pittsburgh, you're talking about them. And what are some of the key things you've been able to do with the universities to help move this even further forward? Well, I think that um, the previous chancellor, Mark Nordenberg, and uh, the previous president, Jerry Cohen of Carnegie Mellon, really were instrumental in getting the universities yep. to talk to each other, to realize that there was this common goal uh, in understanding as we were coming out of the 90s that they were not only the rudder of economic growth, but they were the engine. And what they were producing had this ability to be able to transform an entire region of uh, the United States. So what ended up happening was an entrepreneurial effort on their behalf yeah. to empower faculty, research, drawing in hundreds of millions and billions of dollars into the region and then producing and creating jobs. When we started our administration, I had the benefit of working with them for 12 years as a council member. That was my district. And we were the only part of the city of Pittsburgh to grow in population in 50 years. <laughs> so we grew by 10% in council district eight while the rest of the city lost population and continued a 50 year trend. What had happened was our goal, we wanted to see that type of growth happen throughout the city. So we created a memorandum of understanding with Carnegie Mellon of University, a legal document that allowed them to become the R&D department for the city and allowed us to become the urban lab for the university. We created the world's smartest traffic signals, um, traffic signals that actually learn and that use real-time data in order to be able to lessen idling time by 32%. Uh, we've, we've been working with them with sensor detection in order to determine the conditions of roads, putting that information out so it's not who lives on the street to determine which street gets paved, but what street needs to get paved. And we've been working with them on basically taking those types of initiatives and then turning them into industry. And how we do it is a partnership that is three parts. It's the city being willing to open up. We are the first city to allow autonomous vehicles on our streets. We now have five companies that have over 3,500 jobs and are investing $4 billion into the city with autonomous vehicles on our streets. But we allow the city to be, become that urban lab. We find the research that is being done that can become industry, and then we partner with our foundation community in order to fund it, to get it started, and then to help us to grow it locally. So it has a, a benefit where everyone plays a role. And I don't want to harp on this too much, and I'm going to ask you a, a different question, but the last thing he said, if the city and the university said to that foundation community, this is important, there's money. And it shows up very quickly. So all our research at Carnegie Mellon, I was brought there, you probably don't even, we were, I was brought there by Senator Hines when he was still alive, and his father, <laughs> who was still alive, that created an endowment for a center for economic development. And this just went on. When the problem was identified in people, when we were talking about those arts and cultural, the creation of a sprout fund to make these very small scale investments. So that foundation piece, um, before we turn to inclusion, which I want to get to, because that's the second part of the story, I want to ask you a very specific question, because you and I had a chance to catch up. Bill's hopefully going to serve as literally, he has no term limits. He needs to serve as long as he feels like he, but I asked him, I said, if you left the mayorship, what would you do? I'm not putting you on the spot, I don't think. He said, well, I would work with the public policy schools at the two great universities, Gispia, which is at the University of Pittsburgh, the Graduate School of Public and International, roughly, International Affairs, I screwed that up. No, yes, and the Heinz School, it used to be called the School of Urban and Public Affairs, it's now the Heinz School of Management and Information. And he said, I'd work with the two of them to bring them together with a focus on urban and cities. So I guess what I'm asking you is, we have created the world's first school of cities. Uh, according to the benchmarking Sean and others done, we've had more than 400, maybe 500 faculty members engaged in doing urban affairs, okay. some in computer science, some in public health, some in social sciences, some in geography, some in planning, some in business like me. 
What would, you, what would you encourage us to do or a school or a center of urbanism like that? As a mayor, what would be the kind of pressing problems that you would see our work best informing or helping to solve? So I would think about it as would think tanks that work on global issues do and provide to countries to be able to work together on the local scale. Mm -hmm. um, we have a mutual friend, uh, Don Iveson, the mayor of Edmonton. Uh, one of the best mayors in this world. Um, he was instrumental in putting together what's called the Edmonton Doctrine. And what the Edmonton Doctrine is, is the science behind climate change. It's a way of creating a metric where we all work off of the same set of data and we all are able to show accomplishment at a local level over something that we can all agree upon, not as politicians, but by deriving it through scientists. If you were to create the Edmonton Doctrine for traffic mitigation, yeah. for uh, ability to do predictive analytics for crime, the opportunity to look at the benefits of park and open space, and you think about yeah. all the critical issues that involve a city, and you can provide that standard. A school of cities could provide the world the opportunity to work off best practices better than any of the large philanthropic yep. organizations that are doing it today. And it's a natural for Toronto and Canada because we are a place that the world, you know, we're 50% foreign born, we're a place that the world feels comfortable. Let's turn to inclusion. Just because, one last thing on sorry, that, because yes, I, I hit on the UN SDGs before. Yeah, 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 yeah. But everybody thinks of them as, how are my, how's my federal government exactly. gonna do this? They're never gonna be implemented at a federal right. level. They're going to be implemented on a local level. You're gonna eradicate hunger. You don't do it on a national basis. You do it by making yeah. sure that that food kitchen has enough food that they're being able to provide it to the people in that area. And it's hyper-local. So if you were to take the U UN SDGs yep. and to put together the plan of how each city can adopt them and be able to have cities compete, because cities love to compete, then you would have an amazing tool to actually make that happen. And this has recurred in Toronto history. What can it do like the UN? What kind of international institutions? I hate to use a crude analogy like a UN for cities. We'd come up with, how could you have a new United Nations for cities? It's silly. But you could see Toronto and the School of Cities and the, the character of this city doing that. I want to turn to inclusion uh, because it's something, you know, when we were starting, we were, oh, Pittsburgh's a very inclusive place. It, although like any American city, it's had its issues of, of racism and racial injustice terrible slum clearance program in the Hill. But it, it is a city that through its political apparatus, through its community development corporations, which are another part of the whole story, you know, neighborhood-based revitalization, not just top-down, developed kind of inclusion as part of its bloodstream and its DNA. But what happened, of course, in a way that I don't think you and I would have predicted, I don't think anyone would have predicted, we were looking at a city in decline, a city in crisis, a city in catastrophe, a city that couldn't keep police and schools, and then all of a sudden, Bam, technology center, high tech, next Silicon Valley, or at least the next Austin, Pittsburgh takes off. And then the issue becomes, hold on, are these new, I'm just giving you what I read in the press, mm -hmm. is this gentrification? Mm -hmm. Is this a neighborhood that I can feel comfortable in? Is there a battle between, again, from the headlines of the paper, the old Pittsburgh and the new Pittsburgh? Now, you're mayor, so you might, if I'm reading this in the paper, you must be feeling some of this in a city that has great neighborhood-based... So you began to think in a different way about inclusive innovation, placemaking with an, inclusion, an eye towards inclusion. How did that happen in your administration? Because I, I had left the city, I've not watched. How have you begun to steward this next shift away from just innovation and tech and growth towards more inclusive innovation and more inclusive growth? So first off, you're dealing with a culture that has watched a city consistently lose people, yep. jobs, and companies for 50 years. So there is part of that community that is excited to see the stabilization yep. and growth. But there's also a part of it that may not have been around for the bad days that see any of the growth right now as a threat. And you have to take both of them equally. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's sort of like, I often say, is driving with one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake. 
Uh, you want to see the growth occur, but not at the cost of yep. other people. Uh, gentrification occurs when a, a person or a company is displaced, when there's no longer an opportunity for them to stay at what is considered home. And we do have areas in the city right now where the market is so hot yep. that it is affecting long-term businesses or long-term families to start to move out. And we have created for the families a um, affordable housing trust fund that we put $10 million a year into in order to be able to minimize any of the negative effects. That, is that enough? No, and I'd like to see that be $20 million a year, and I think we'd have a much more effective means to be able to address it. Uh, but at that same time, I have neighborhoods that haven't seen a dollar of yep. investment for 50 years, and people are leaving those neighborhoods because they don't want to be in a neighborhood where there's crime and blight. And disinvestment can drive people out of a community just as fast or faster than investment. So there is no one-size-fits-all economic tool. And when you deal with a city that has very cold and very hot markets, mm -hmm. you create yeah, yeah, yeah. policies around the neighborhood. So, you know, when Soho saw um, the rapid growth of about 20 years ago and all of a sudden, Old Navy's moving into what is the uh, bohemian heart of New York. They created laws within that area to limit the amount of square feet that any business can operate in order to push out big box and be able to protect small business. And they used a very interesting tool. They didn't make it throughout all of New York. They used it for Soho. So as we look at areas like Lawrenceville and East Liberty, we're looking at inclusionary zoning as a mandate, when we look at other areas that are cold markets, all housing is affordable because nobody is moving there for uh, a high price. And then as we look at markets in between, we look at how we can incentivize um, affordability. So you, you, you do it by the specific neighborhood and you use different tools for different purposes. But let me just say this about equity. We get so caught up in talking about equity when it comes to housing or um, especially in the United States, access to health care or education. But equity applies to every service yep. that a government offers. You should be thinking yep. about what are you doing with light equity? In what neighborhoods do you have street lights on every single pole? And then in what other neighborhoods is there only a light at the corner? Because the way that we distribute anything needs to be put through a filter of equity. So we've created, we're the fifth city in the United States to create it. Within my office, we have a staff of 13, an office of equity, so that everything that we look at, just as our office of management and budget looks at efficiency and effectiveness, our office of equity looks at equity. Well, you're, you're, um, your city was hit by an unspeakable tragedy. I mean, I mean even thinking about it almost brings me to tears. Um, the Tree of Life Synagogue in what is America's greatest neighborhood, there is no doubt in this, is America's greatest neighborhood, uh, was hit by a terrorist attack. Your leadership was the most amazing thing I ever seen in my life. Um, and your leadership now on gun control. You know, we don't have that. We have problems in Toronto, but what, and I think this audience would, would like to hear about that. Um, because we had our own terrorist attack here with a car. Um, it's something all of our cities are going to have to live with. Uh, but how you responded to that, how it's affected you, and then, and then your continued leadership on gun control. So on gun control, the United States has a problem that we aren't recognizing or not at least being truthful about. And there are solutions, and we're not considering them. Um, and we decided in Pittsburgh we were done waiting for Washington to do something. And even though the state of Pennsylvania has added to the crime code to put criminal charges against any elected official who tries to implement uh, gun laws, we decided it was worth it. And I had six very courageous members of council. We're all facing criminal charges. There's orders for my impeachment in Harrisburg, and we have several lawsuits against the city. So we, um, we put together what we believe were reasonable and common sense approaches. Uh, and the other cities in the country are watching our court case. If we get some traction, I think you're going to see it spread throughout the United States, and maybe that will warm the water 
enough to get Washington to do something. Um, I lost friends at Tree of Life. I live seven blocks from Tree of Life. I was there that morning. Uh, it was the only time my chief of staff ever had to do the two-call rule, which means on a weekend, if I'm sleeping in, I'm not picking up the phone. And if it's an emergency, hang up and call a second time, and I knew something was wrong. And um, it was we were standing outside, and it was raining and cold. I looked across the street, and I saw a friend of mine, Wazi Muhammad, and I walked across, and I said, what are you doing here? And as I looked, I saw Wazi was the executive director of the Islamic Center. I saw the entire executive board of the Islamic Center there standing in the rain. And he said, we have to be here. Uh, the Jewish community was there for us after September 11th. Um, something like that doesn't happen unless it's been worked and worked and worked yep. on a continual basis. Pittsburgh has always had a very strong interfaith community, uh, and they do work together. But what was really symbolic was we waited until a week after the last funeral before we came together as a city. We, we followed Jewish rule in being able to do that. And as we gathered there with Franco Harris and uh, Michael Keaton came home for it and all these other people just had to be there, it was the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht. And it was the 80th anniversary when Jews were being killed in Czechoslovakia, Austria, and Germany, and the police turned their back. It was the 80th anniversary when synagogues were being burned to the ground and elected officials did nothing. And it was the 80th anniversary as the beginning of the Holocaust took off that the community leaders stayed silent. And what Pittsburgh did on that 80th anniversary is said never again. And police officers ran into that building. Politicians, Democrats and Republicans said no more hate. No more hate talk, because hate talk leads to hate speech, which leads to hate crimes. And we pulled together all of our community leaders, and we stood up for our neighbors. Um, that's what shone through. I, I was just saying what Pittsburghers were doing. Yeah. Well, it shone through to the world. Um, what do you think now given the political climate in both our countries. And, and don't think it's that rosy here. Um, <laughs> uh, we have a several populist, right populist premiers. Look, we're going to have a federal election. The United States is Donald Trump. And populism is on the resurgence. You and I have talked about this since the day we met. And the need to build a kind of new progressive urban, I hate those words, but some kind of coalition you know, maybe it goes back to when we were talking about trying to fix Pittsburgh back in the dark days of Pittsburgh's poor leadership. What could we all start to do now um, at the city level, at the local level? You know what I'm saying? You kind of said it. It's happening yep. at the local level. What could we do in Canada and the United States, in our towns, in our neighborhoods, to kind of begin the process of building a new, a new kind of movement that maybe isn't coming through? I, I'm, you, you can tell me I'm wrong. That isn't coming through our national parties. You know what I'm saying? That there is some other maybe path. Any... Any hints or hopes on that? Absolutely. So it was uh, <clears throat> my friend Denny Coderre uh, in 2016 said, don't let him become your president. <laughs> and I said, we're not that crazy, Denny. <laughs> and he said, if he does, I'm building a wall and you're paying for it. <laughs> um, it really gets back to the, the basics of what we've been talking about for this past 30 minutes. It is at the local level where the world's problems will be solved. Yep. No matter who is in the federal house, in, our, in the US and the White House, you know, when, when the president announced that he was pulling out of Pitts, or Paris agreement <laughs> and he used Pittsburgh as the <laughs> example, um, that set off a movement. We had 64 cities in the United States that had sworn to the Paris agreement that day and there's over 440 today um, because we realize that we can all reduce our carbon footprint a certain amount and live to the, see the Paris Agreement happen. 
when we talk about refugee crisis, you know, if you don't want to see a refugee crisis, stop making refugees uh, is a good way. But we also know that the climate is also going to be a major factor for the next several decades. Cities will be asked to take on more people. And if we each say, okay, we can handle an additional 3,000 or an additional 4,000, we don't have a crisis anymore. We have a way of working through it. And we don't need federal offices to tell us to do that. We need to be able, as city leaders, to recognize that we all have a place in this world and we all have a responsibility. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> Great to see you. Thanks, folks. Go Peduto. So, this brings us to the conclusion uh, of our program for today. Uh, what an inspiring talk to get us thinking about uh, how to build uh, inclusive, uh, resilient, and just uh, cities. A few uh, thoughts uh, from uh, Mayor uh, Peduto's speech uh, and, and discussion. The focus on the local that, that, and, and the notion that uh, the local level is where the world's problems are going to be solved. I think that's such a pertinent and apropos uh, thought uh, for what's going on uh, and, and the challenges that we face here in, in Toronto. Uh, the, the role of our local institutions uh, to address the issues here and then aggregate those up to a provincial and national scale. And also the idea of, um, of, of investing. The notion that when the going got tough, in Pittsburgh, and it was extremely bleak, uh, as was mentioned. Uh, Pittsburgh didn't uh, sell off, they invested. And I think that's such an important lesson for us in cities, that there's a difference between spending and investment. And investment is what builds communities and what builds prosperity for the future. And I think the lesson from Pittsburgh is to reinvest when there are challenges, will pay uh, dividends down the road. And we're in a moment now where we can either sell off or we can invest. And I think uh, what Pittsburgh's experience tells us is investing is the path uh, to future prosperity and future inclusivity and fairness and justice. So with that, that brings us uh, to, the, to the conclusion. Um, just one comment uh, uh, about the School of Cities, because I think that the role of universities and university institutions really ran through uh, today's entire programming. Uh, the role that, that we uh, can play uh, in training the next generation and as a, as a convener. And um, Jason uh, from Hamilton uh, spoke earlier where he said, authority is yesterday. That was his comment on, uh, on, on government. And I would say uh, for universities, the saying could be universities as isolated institutions is yesterday. If we ever were truly isolated in an ivory tower, separated from our cities, those days are gone. We need to be part of our communities. And the School of Cities, uh, with leadership from the president's office uh, uh, throughout the rest of the institution, has really, uh, I think, for us uh, at the University of Toronto, created a sense of dynamism and a sense of uh, opportunity for collaborations and a sense of building and a sense where we can uh, come together to contribute uh, our convening role, our training role, our research role, to support uh, the work and, and contribute to the work. To not do studies on communities, but to do studies with communities and help them do studies by those communities themselves. This is a new way of thinking about city building, uh, and I think the School of Cities and universities more broadly can be front and center uh, in, in that movement. Uh, before we adjourn, I want to say uh, a, a list of thank yous, uh, because an event like this uh, took a lot of people, a lot of time, a lot of talent to bring together, and I'm ever so grateful uh, for what was accomplished today. Um, to my colleagues, uh, Shauna Braille, uh, who uh, led uh, the planning uh, committee, uh, Miriam Lowe, uh, Mark Fox, uh, Richard Florida, uh, the leadership uh, committee of the School of Cities, uh, thank you. Uh, to the team uh, that, that brought this together within the School of Cities, Laura Muldoon, Nina Haikara, Ben Liu, uh, were instrumental in making this happen. We had great support from uh, the vice president of, of research, uh, Ken Michael John, government relations, uh, Kenzie McKeegan, uh, 
Amanda Poulter, the U of T Communications, and the Office of uh, the President with Daniela uh, Trapani. Uh, and also uh, the Agenda Committee, uh, uh, Sarah Sharma, Sarah Hughes, uh, John Hannigan, Erica Allen Kim, Drew Fagan, and Shoshana Sachs. It takes a big team uh, to bring together uh, an event like this and to convene, and I'm deeply appreciative of uh, what we accomplished today. So let's give a round of applause to those who helped us plan this. And the, the, the last word is that this is just the beginning of the conversation. That, that, that we've said uh, all throughout the day that the school is going to be a place where we convene. This is the beginning. Uh, we will be hosting many other events, including our collaboration with the library for the speaker series that will start in September. So please keep an eye out for that. But also with many of you in this room, if you have ideas uh, and ways that we can uh, come together, that the School of Cities can uh, be a partner with you, we would love to hear from you. You can reach out to me personally or my colleagues. Uh, we are always fielding uh, inquiries. Uh, we're meeting with uh, lots of people and we would love to continue uh, these conversations. So for today, thank you very much and to be continued. <laughs>